Hello, everyone. Welcome to Christian Hangout number 25. Uh, this is it. Before we begin, I'll just like to say that this is close to being the one-year anniversary of the Christian Hangout because we did the first one one year and one week ago today. So that's kind of cool. So this is sort of the anniversary episode. Um, returning participants, we have Mark Citadel. We have Northern Irish All Star, and we have two newcomers. We have uh, we have Miles from the Godcast on. TRS, would you like to introduce yourself, Miles? Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, yep. I am from, my name is Miles. I am from The Godcast, as was mentioned. Uh, you could follow us on Twitter at The Godcast TJC, spelled just like it sounds. And you can listen to our podcast on soundcloud.com slash truth underscore justice underscore the Christian way. Or you can pick us up at uh, radio.therightstuff.biz. Cool. And would you like to tell us about your background with Christianity? Uh, absolutely. Uh, for most of my teenage years, I was the worst sort of fedora-tipping atheist. Um, and uh, after that, no lie, uh, I was actually brought to Christ through Amway, of all things. Uh, what? Amway. Amway? Yep, yep. The soap salesman. Oh. Yep. Wow. Started doing that in high school. Uh, and my friends uh, who were in it, they, uh, whenever anything was going wrong or anything wasn't going so right or they were having a tough time, they just said, you know what, I leave it all to God. And after about a year or two of being exposed to that, I'm like, there's something to this. So I ended up converting, and uh, over the years, uh, my theology is really, I'm just about Catholic at this point in my theology. And uh, yeah, my, uh, my passion has really been more on the uh, historical and the uh, apologetic side of Christianity more so than the interrelational side. I should probably work on that. Huh. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's how it is with a lot of us. I think we still need to get stronger Christian communities and relationships built, but we live in kind of a difficult time. Yeah. As far as also, let's be honest, people uh, people with reactionary mindsets tend to be a little bit on the uh, be crass, the autistic side. <laughs> I can say, yeah, I know what that's like. <laughs> but, uh, all right, well, is there anything else you wanted to say about that? or No, no. Okay, well, thank you. Um, and we also have with us uh, from West Coast Reactionaries, we have Alexander. How would you like to introduce yourself, please, Alexander? You were in the hot seat. Hello. <laughs> Hello, my name is Alexander. I'm an editor at West Coast Reactionaries. I was... Um, baptized C of E and I was only really Church of England because when I got about 10 or 11 years old my mother like a lot of people decided that they should throw themselves into the faith to get their child into a good school I went into a good school and I decided to rebel against religion <laughs> and I went in as uh, Miles was saying into a relatively fedora tipping phase but I've seen the errors of my ways now and I'm studying the catechism with a very very reactionary traditionist priest in my um, uh, university chaplaincy. So if any of you are around the Bristol or West Coast area and you want to hit me up, just find my YouTube and private message me. So on a scale of one to the Crusaders did nothing wrong, how reactionary is this guy? <laughs> this guy, a fool. I'd say he's about six or seven. Uh, okay. He has Pretty a good gain on. He hasn't read Gain On, but he, he says that the modern world is an illusion. <laughs> and it's a delusion. That, that would indicate and, and, he has read Gain On, is just isn't telling you. No, I, no, 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 he hasn't because of anything, but he has Kenneth Clark's Civilization on his bookshelf, and he has a few others. But his sermons, are they're so powerful. I mean, I was quivering because you know that um, where Kierkegaard once wrote his book, Fear and Trembling, he got from St. Paul. And St. Mm. Paul said that we should worship and um, uh, uh, that we should worship in fear and trembling. And there was a time in one of his sermons that I did feel that fear and trembling. And he is a very, very kind man. He's a very young man. He's only in his 30s. He studied at um, uh, Oxford University. He's a very intelligent man. He was at Brussels in France for, a long, for, for, for much of his time. And um, I feel that he's drawing me into the Catholic Church. But I do have a few metaphysical problems with the Catholic Church, which I don't know if you want to talk about tonight, but perhaps we'll talk about in a private chat sometime. Um, well, we, can, we can bring them up. I don't see why not. Yeah, I'm not opposed to that. If we have something to discuss, yeah. Okay, well, the problem that I'm having at the moment is the mystery of the Trinity. Hmm. Well, they... There's the whole thing with the filial quay where they believe the the uh, Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. 
right? Yeah, I'm not sure that's what you're talking about, is it? Well, that's that's older Nicene uh, doctrine. It's the uh, God is eternal. They're all uh, the the whole Godhead is eternal, but the Son proceeds eternally from the Father, and the Spirit proceeds eternally from the Son. There's the, the problem that I have with it. Okay, I mean, I've talking to James, and if any of you are aware of this, um, this is stuff on West Coast reactionaries. But the problem that I have is that if A equals X and B equals X and C equals X, then A equals B equals C. So I don't understand how uh, the, the Son and the Father can be God and yet not be the same. Um, this is a, this actually, I, I listened to a podcast on this from uh, Reasonable Faith. Um, there's actually a whole uh, series on the doctrine of the Trinity. Yeah. Um, this is a grammatical problem with English, uh, and I think the distinction, uh, his name is uh, William Lane Craig, uh, the distinction Dr. Craig makes is a uh, an is of identity versus an is of position. So every member of the Trinity is each a person, and they're all God as a matter of uh, status, I guess, but the Father isn't the Son, isn't the Spirit. So logically, it's not an if and only if statement. Uh, uh, not the way you're thinking about it now. Uh, yeah, I would actually agree. I think it departs from that very Western, dare I say, Greek uh, mindset. It's almost it's almost a little formal, strand yeah. of the Hindu kind well, of idea, well, isn't it? Well, well, James said it was formal logic. I don't know if any of you have studied the difference between formal logic and moral logic, but he said that that sort of Aristotelian idea that you have the... Um, you know, is and if and only if and moral consistency, uh, sorry, logical consistency. But that actually breaks down when it comes to the mystery of the Trinity. Is that right? Yeah, I, I, I think I've... Did James talk about that in one of our podcasts on West, uh, on the Plebeian podcast? No, I think you know, he may he have talk, he, that No, no, no. He, talk, he, he talked about it when we were doing the Dante, Esotericism oh, of Dante. Oh, yes, that? that's right. Yep, that's right. How could I forget that? Yeah, I, rec I do recommend people go and check that out on James's channel if you mm. can. It's, uh, it's a very good, it's a little, just an introductory stuff, but if you're interested in Dante, it's actually, it was, I, I found it quite fascinating. What is James's channel? I can't remember the handle at the moment. Uh, okay. Let me try and find it. I've got it, um, I've got him subbed. Yeah, me too. That's how it often goes. I'll shoot that over to you, Ian, uh, in okay. our little chat up here, because I am subscribed yep okay bringing it up now but yeah um, i i definitely would uh, say that's that's an apologetics issue that's uh i i at least from what i've heard it is to do with um the definition it's, of um, personhood etc and things yeah. like that so there are resources it's called ed is called um edward mass yeah here we go oh right there's the link to the video there at least all right, I'll check this out here. Yeah. Yeah, that actually is a um, an interesting topic you bring up with regards to the Trinity. That's that's an objection that a lot of people tend to have. Um, mm -hmm. And I think uh, what cleared it up was just being very clear on the terms and exactly how we should think about it. Let me actually, you know what? Let me see if I can go ahead and find that uh, that lecture. I'll go ahead and post that in the show notes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I think... in the chat. I think one of the things that I've heard that makes the, the Trinity so difficult to explain to people is that uh, typically when we're explaining things, we try to liken them to other things. And there's nothing you can really liken the Trinity to. There's not any sort of earthly phenomena that I'm aware of that bears any kind of semblance um, to it. I disagree. Um, when we think of the Godhead, we're thinking of one being... Yeah. And each of the members as different persons or centers of consciousness within the being. Yep. Um, a good a good example, I think, in real life would be a set of twins who are uh, permanently conjoined. Um, mm. So you have two people, two centers of consciousness in one physical being. The thing I thought you were going to oh, say so was on. dissociative identity disorder. No, that's no, no, the no, one no. that some people do bring up, and I think that does also have problems with it. Oh, that that has a lot of problems. Just, just, yeah, I'm sorry. 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 So, 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 sorry to interrupt, but I don't want to be like Sam Harris and that Peterson Harris um, <laughs> um, podcast and get hung up on semantics. But what did you mean by center of consciousness? I'm, could you define that for me? Because I'm not really sure what you mean. Um, 
That is actually a good question. It's uh, it's hard to define. Um, uh, um, uh, a being that can refer to itself as I. Yeah, the conscious agent. And and an I. Does that make sense? A self. But, but, but isn't um so sorry but, but if if I'm correct, doesn't God uh, only God and Jesus have the authority to say I am? Oh uh, well, the Spirit would well, it, would as the well. The Holy Spirit should also. You know, since he's also God. Yeah, I haven't read anything that says the spirit can't say that. Yeah. But can we say that? Are you on a mobile device there, Sam? Yes, I am. Yeah, I can tell. Uh, but, but can we say I with authority? It. Can I say with authority, I am? Well, you could say you are Alexander. You would have that first-person self-referential experience of being Alexander, God would have the first person self-referential uh, experience of being God, or Jesus, or the Father, or the Spirit. So so there's 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 a differentiation between being. It's almost like there's our conscious being, and there's the Heideggerian being of Dasein, which is being within being. Is that kind of what you're trying to get across? Uh, no, I wouldn't say being within being. Under two, is this it? Uh, yeah, let me go ahead and post this in the show notes. No, I, I don't think I'd want to say that. I think the way it is, it's like um, with God, um, his being is entirely self-defined and self. I don't know how to say it's like, for example, I'm five foot nine, but I'm not five foot nine because. I decided to be five foot nine is that like I'm just it's something that's been forced on me. Mm. Well with God it's kind of like he doesn't really have any external um constructs that are forced upon him from what I understand. I don't know if that's fully orthodox or Well he does he does have characteristics that are yeah. I, you wouldn't say forced upon him, but they're inherent in his in the definition of what he is. So right. he can say, that, "I am that, omnipotent," it, for example. Is that is that is that a contingent or a necessary being? Because one of the problems that I have about Christ as well, and about the the the, the Christ being truly man and truly God, mm. is that if God is necessary and yep. man is contingent, does that mean that the truly man aspect of Jesus is contingent or necessary? Oh, the, um, mm, the, the from, the Aquinas, from, from Aquinas' understanding. Uh, I would say that the human nature of uh, Jesus would be contingent because if mankind had yes. never sinned, there would be no need for Jesus to take on a, uh, a human form and redeem man. Yeah, And he takes or, on a human form at some t period time A. He does not have that human form prior to that. It's incarnate, so this would. But again, but, 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 but again, again, when you use the word like form, what does that mean? Does it mean that the human form that he takes is an illusion? That it's a phantasm? Uh, it's no, just that a, would a be oh, um, that would be. Oh, I can't remember. Gnosticism. What that was. Gnosticism. Yeah, that he merely appeared to be human. No, he would literally incarnate in flesh and blood. So that would be the form that he took. So you're saying that Jesus is necessary and contingent? Uh, his the natures differentiate. So uh, his... the, sec the second person of the Trinity is a necessary being, being part of the Godhead. But the human nature that he takes on would be contingent. Would be contingent because we'd have a problem saying that it was but then, but then, necessary. On, because on, if on, you, you said that, said... you'd have to make humanity necessary. I, I don't want to be pedantic, but you said the nature that he takes on which means that what he is is something that is external to man and therefore necessary, so that he takes on a contingent being, but he is actually necessary. Well, yeah, he has two natures. But, but I, but the I, second I nature is taken it's, it's on. One. The first nature is already there. So one is prior to the second. Yeah. Yeah. The human hmm. nature uh, is, is taken on at some point. Because he, he can't have the human nature, for example, prior to humanity being created, can he? Oh, I guess he could. It would just so be rather all... awkward. <laughs> it would just be rather awkward. So I suppose, so, so I suppose what, you're, what you're saying is almost like the beginning of John, where he was initially the Word, 
and then the mm. word was made flesh. Is that what you're saying? I guess. Yes. Yes, yep. exactly. And I would actually relate this to what um, I referred to this in James's uh, Dante uh, dialogue. Merche Eliade talked about about the difference between uh, eternal, uh, oh, what did he mythic history, and then oh no, mythic time and historical time. In that he comes out of mythic time and enters historical time at that certain point of his incarnation. So now, that- see, I would. I, I would dispute that mostly because I think God came into time at the creation of the universe. I think he existed timelessly before the creation of the universe and before the creation of time, but that's yeah, no, 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 this is not the, um, this isn't, he's not talking about time in the apologetic sense of what, you know, time okay. means scientifically that we're considering. He's, he, he actually like relates it more to, um, for instance, pre-Christian religions and how, oh, okay. what their rituals were related to, which I'm, was I'm, sort I'm, of reliving this mythic time. Okay. And when okay. you mention and when when you mention time as well, I mean you mentioned mythic time, but yep. when you say timelessness, do you mean an eternity of linear progression or do you mean the eternity of the moment? That is a perpetual time, which is almost like the um uh uh uh, uh the velocity of a spinning disc, which is it is always yeah. accelerating but it is never moving. It has zero velocity but it's always accelerating. Yeah, I d- I don't want to equate mythic time with timelessness in the sense of in the sense, well, the, apologist, you, um, the apologist you, means when he says, when the apologist says timelessness, he means the state before God created time. So when there was nothing else, when there was only God, at that time, mythic time doesn't exist. So all of the things that we talk about taking place in mythic time that uh, pre-Christian religions, for instance, and certainly some post-Christian religions uh, refer to, and their rituals reflect, those things are not from a timeless state. They're from a state though that uh, takes place so, so, before his history prior as we know it. So you're saying that that mythic time, that time before creation, was a perpetual eternity of a moment, as opposed to an well, eternal. A little stretching. bit in the eternity of moment, but it's not before creation. It's actually, in many cases, at creation, at the point of creation. Eliade viewed the rituals of most pre-Christian religions as trying to relive in historical time the moment of mythic time. They were recreating creation to try and get back to that perfect state, that Edenic state that they could they lost. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think right now we're hitting little levels of esotericism that shouldn't even be possible. I should have a book open in front of me if I'm ever to talk like this. And it's like literally <laughs> 20 past midnight. <laughs> uh, the one, speak of uh, mythic time and creation and all that stuff, uh, is there like, what are your guys' opinion on creationism versus evolution? Is it like, is there a middle ground between the two or is it like, you have to choose either one or the other. Well, doesn't does, does, doesn't it um bring up the philosophical question of whether or not God creates the universe and then steps back and doesn't intervene? Because mm. surely a sort of um evolutionary perspective is that God is the necessary cause or that He is the first cause, but He yeah. doesn't intervene in human society. Well, that, and that, if you that accept that, I mean, how how can you accept that? No, there is a there is a. There is certainly a thesis which says he creates it and then intervenes to guide evolution. Is one of the popular theories out there that he, he makes sure that evolution evolution goes a certain way because it could have gone another way very easily. Uh, oh, uh, the uh, theistic evolution. Yeah, yeah, that would be a, a theory that would rival. But do, both doesn't that imply that evolution? Theory. Doesn't that imply? Doesn't that imply that evolution is a linear progression upwards as opposed to just an amoral, a spiritual change of states? Evolution is definitely something that takes place in historical time, I'd say. I I wouldn't attribute evolution to mythic time, which is why I'd say it doesn't appear in any, at least that I can think of, um, sort of pre-Christian religion, religious conceptions. None of them really talk about evolution. Well, uh, the, the idea was floated, I think, by Aristotle, but... Was it in any... Any kind of sort of advanced or scientific? Oh no, no, no! Well, the, the whole notion of science got started in the Middle Ages. I yeah. mean, you're, you're talking about someone who thought that uh, objects only moved in straight lines. So if you threw something, it wouldn't travel in a parabola; it would go straight, stop, and come back down. Yeah. And he w- would he be thinking of like a common ancestor for crows and humans, for example? Or was uh, it more sort of geared towards things do adapt over time and change? Because I think that people maybe acknowledged that before it was scientifically proven, honestly, because it just seems you could actually witness it. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, well, yeah. I think I think you could have you you could have it. You could almost introduce Heraclitus into this because he said that you can never step into the same river twice. And in a way, I suppose you could argue that although nature changes and the form of nature changes, that it still remains the same in a way. And that sameness is the Holy Spirit, I suppose. Yeah, that is a nice way of putting it, actually. I guess I just don't see any need to couch it in those terms. I mean, personally, I don't think. Uh, I think macroevolution is, uh, at least Darwinian macroevolution is tragically flawed. I don't think uh, the Darwinian mechanism can account for the variety of species. Jumps. Species. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it account for that. I don't think it's a death blow. I think it needs to be reformulated. But I don't see any reason. I don't see any problem with God saying "let there be" and front loading everything that happens. I mean, what about the Cambrian explosion? Uh, what about it? Or how do you think it relates to that? Do you think that that's explained by macroevolution, or that it remains an unsolved? Oh no, I think I think it remains unsolved. I think uh, I think the Darwinian uh, mechanism is insufficient. Personally, I don't see any problem theologically with scientific Darwinian macroevolution, with God's just saying let there be and front loading everything so everything happened the way He intended it. Mm. I don't think that's the case. I don't see a problem with it. Well, there's the verse in Acts that says, um, I have in front of me, says, From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. Now, I mean, that may be referring to human nations, but it also kind of implies that, you know, different groups of people, or you could extrapolate that to different types of organisms, do develop over time, and some go yeah. extinct over time, and some, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah. it seems along the same line. Yeah, you could. Oh, this isn't, this isn't really an issue that I'm going to like, oh, this is wrong, and I I'm not going to get better. This yeah, this I honestly like don't. I think that the whole evolution debate thing is completely overblown in its actual impact upon people. I don't think that it's a huge... Like, I know Sargon of Akkad makes a huge deal out of all oh, the teaching creationism at schools and things. Like, it really doesn't actually affect anything. If they do that or if they teach evolution, it doesn't actually affect what people... It's like if a school taught, taught that... Uh, Napoleon was actually exiled to Antarctica. It's not going to change any any aspect of what goes on. It's just a historical sort of falsity. Yeah. So it's not. There are far more relevant things that are being falsely propagated in, in today's universities. Well, it, I think evolution to be a huge issue. It's signaling. It's something easy to signal against. Because what's what's the easiest population to hate? Southern evangelical Christians. That's like. Yeah. Yeah. Grade A, square one, prime hatred material. That is just, everyone is allowed to hate them. I mean, they do make themselves an easy target in many ways. Uh, to an extent, but I don't I, I don't even think that's the case. It's just that there are other there are other more simple and sillier things to say, but no one no one's allowed to do it. You know what I mean? Like the We Was Kangs types. Oh, yeah, but I, well, obviously they get a free pass. They're yeah, a protected well, class. <laughs> An interesting episode today where to... Um, uh, gentlemen, should we say, in my in my in my university class, um, were joking about raping my professor, <laughs> uh, which is interesting. Was she um, was she a female? Yes. Oh, well, that's... she well, she yeah, can't um... be a male. Well, that's yeah. Well, I don't know. That's very non-progressive of you, Ian. Well, I'm a reactionary. <laughs> she wasn't um, white. She was a uh, she was Asian. Okay, oh. that's fine. But they were talking about, oh, we're going to... Well, interestingly <laughs> enough, just something I'd like to, um, just a little anecdote I'd like to um, add to the chat, was that we had in our university, in our economics lecture, we have this, I don't know if you have it, Mark, we have this um, software that everybody can comment and post it on this chat that goes on the whiteboard at the front, you know? <laughs> oh. Everybody can comment in real time. Oh, that's a terrible So, so the, the professor will ask a question, and they'll, they'll say something like, oh, you know, what uh, blah blah blah? What does this say about this theory? And then everybody comments, and then he, you know, in a, in a sort of dialectic way. But everybody just said like, "I'm gonna fucking rape you," and I'm gonna like fuck your pussy and that kind of stuff. <laughs> All the chads. It's actually happened. 
or yeah it did it did it did, it did happen it made the national news actually interesting enough. wow because you know in economics a lot of the people as mark will probably testify a lot of the people that study economics are chads and they want to go and work in jp morgan i mean the people that i mean i've spoken to headhunters that have said to me do you want to come and work for kpmg or pwc or jp morgan or goldman sachs you know so you get a lot of chads she ran out of the lecture hall crying and there was a whole thing there's a whole stink about it and people got it um suspended and stuff you know perhaps rightfully so yeah threatening to rape a teacher that's uh that's a little bit beyond the pale mm. do you think yeah well we have a lot of bring uh, we have a lot of british people here on the call i want to make sure i uh use my understatement effectively <laughs> <laughs> well, most of ours, most of ours are gooks, um, Chinese. Yeah. We have, there are two, two things quickly I'd like to say about universities, relating from my own experience at Bristol University, is the first is that we only pay, I mean, we have to pay 9000 a year in tuition fees, but I've actually costed it. I costed it with a couple of other students. One of them's going to Harvard, very, very bright kid. And we costed it that it only costs about two thousand pounds for every student to go to university. It doesn't cost nine thousand pounds at all, and that's sort of um, seven thousand pounds is just going into the pockets of the cucked um, management. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, the same thing is true. And the second, go ahead. And the second point, the second point I'd like to make is about the Chinese. And there are two things. First of all, I've got a friend at Cambridge. And he's in the whole, I mean, he's implicitly gay. I don't approve of his homosexuality, but a huge um, gay network at Cambridge University, and they're all with it, with the professors and so on. And they said that the Chinese students actually pay for their PhDs. They just get bribe the professor, and the professors give them their PhD. No and when we look surprised. at master, at Bristol University, 85 to 90% of the master students in economics are Chinese. And they double the classes because the Chinese, <laughs> the Chinese never speak at the seminars. I always try to speak at the seminars. I'm sure, Mark, you always try to um, contribute something in the seminars. But the Chinese just sit there and never do anything. Yeah, well, that's, that's yeah. how they like it in China. That is, that is. It's, it's a shame. I mean, my, my physics teacher, when I was at A-level, <clears> she actually went to China to teach them how to innovate because the Chinese just copy and they just learn by rote. They, they don't have that entrepreneurial spirit that people in the West do. They don't have, as Max Vida said, the Protestant work ethic. Mm -hmm. um, they definitely lack creativity, I think, in, in some areas. Well, they like creativity in just about every area. I mean, come on. This is uh, saying, well, this is <laughs> yeah, saying, well, this is the way. A Chinaman trying to be saying, nice. Come yeah, on. A Chinaman saying, this is the way we've always done it is a conversation ender. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> no. And they find what they like and they stick with it for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Is that better than saying, oh, we just need to upend society every 50 years here in the West? I don't know. You be the judge. I'll leave that to uh, you. It's yeah, very, it's, I'd say so. But It's very, very, it's very, very interesting that the Chinese developed gunpowder and yet the British and the Europeans conquered the Chinese with gunpowder. Don't you think that just totally exemplifies the Chinese spirit as opposed to the European? Yep. It's because European people are inherently yes. evil and they, they think about violence, whereas those peaceful <laughs> Chinese people just don't, that doesn't occur to them. Yeah. And I mean, the, then, if you look at the, the way that uh, Asian countries have become powerful, it has been in the two most well sort of uh, noted incidents, a case of completely aping Western powers. I mean, take a look at Japan only became powerful prior to World War II because it basically emulated what Germany was doing. And China has only become powerful today from taking communism, which is not Chinese, which came from the West, and then capitalism, which also came from the West. It's, it's, fascinating, it's fascinating that you draw the connection between Japan and Germany, because I think that's very, very important in understanding World War II, because both Japan and Germany were marginal powers that, in um, Toynbee's understanding of history, wanted a seat at the world table. Germany wanted to expand, but it couldn't expand because it was surrounded by sovereign nations. Japan wanted to expand, but it couldn't expand because it was surrounded by colonial powers. 
Um, so, so it's very true that both of these countries are quite similar up to World War II. And even now, be, uh, I think to an extent, because Japan, the interest rates in Japan are like 0.25%. They've been that way for 10 years, haven't they? Mm. Yep. But yeah, they're going through the they, 12 uh, quantitative easing or something. But then, Japan was yeah. starting its colonial period far long before World War II, though. Oh, well, I mean, they've always had sort they, of a colonial relationship with Korea, haven't they? Well, yeah, I mean, they annexed Korea in like well, 1905 or, or I think it was 1910 they officially annexed them, but they signed some treaty five years earlier, which effectively set that in motion. Yeah. So, Bloody nips, even, always conquering stuff. Well, well, I mean, I mean, this is this is the thing about the about World War Two is that people can ask when did World War Two really start, and people in the Anglo world, Americans say it started with Pearl Harbor, which a lot of people would agree that it actually started the World War started when America and the you know, um, USSR came to the war. Other people would say it started in 1939 with the British and French entry into the war, but others would say it started in 1926 when the Japanese attacked China. Yeah. And the Japanese did have imperial ambitions in the early 20th century. But the important thing about Japan is that they isolated themselves for hundreds of years. Don't you think it's very, very interesting that they isolate themselves from Western influence for so long? Hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, they were also isolated. Before the Meiji history. What was the whole incident with the Mongols, where the Mongols tried to invade Japan and were destroyed by, was it like a typhoon? Oh, Kamikaze, uh, Kamikaze yeah, the Divine Wind, I think it was. Yeah, I don't know. It seems like they've always had this sort of sense of, we're on our island, leave us alone. And then... But but then but then but then compare that compare the Japanese history to the English because yes. the English were saved but in the Spanish Armada by the weather and by the English Channel yeah. and even Switzerland have been able to isolate themselves with their mountains but China but, but Japan sorry Japan has developed a very very um, uh, uh, independent and distinct culture through its isolation and Britain hasn't developed a distinct culture through its isolation. The biggest, see, the biggest problem with the the actual armada was that it was Spanish. I think it was actually the fact that it was Spanish because the Spanish are what can they do? They're, they're never any good at anything. The Spanish is it? There's no fair jay, but the Spaniards. <laughs> they're in the middle well, of. Hang on, hang on. It's like the Italians as well. They're not very good either. Like, you know, just just. A, not well, no, 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 I will, I will grant, I will grant that one. To, to be honest, but. you need to understand the Spanish. The Spanish at the time, the Spanish Armada, were the European power. They were the world power because when the Silk Road was destroyed by the Ottoman expansion. The Spanish were, and the Portuguese were the first to progress into the New World. Yeah. And the Spanish were the world power at that time. The Spanish Armada was not because of British pride or because of its dogged spirit. It was because of the typhoons and the weather of the, uh, and the frigates as well. Right, I mm. But and, Spain and it, were a world power at that time. They weren't a the marginal Spanish, power. The Spanish Empire was really finished off by the crash in the silver market, as I remember. Yep. Very, which also very destroyed true. China. Right. Well, I don't know. It, did the Spanish yes. Empire ever crash? Because we have people in the Philippines named Xintong Sanchez. I mean, come on. No, no, you're what right. You're right. No, it did. It did. Mark, 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 Mark is right. Mark is right. It did crash because they exploited the silver and the gold from the New World. They brought it back into Europe, and this caused hyperinflation. They dumped it in China. I mean, they did. They and they did. Yes, they did dump it. But but the point is, it ruined the economy because they they used their gold just to, I mean, I say just because I'm studying economics, but they used it to furnish cathedrals and things like that. They didn't put it into investments. They used it for consumption. And in that consumption, they caused inflation, and that inflation destroyed their economy. Mm -hmm. mm. Isn't that interesting to think that there was a time when precious metals could crash an economy? Well, no, no, it's not. It's not at all, because, because when we look at currency exchanges now, I mean, the same principle abides. If if gold is very, very um, cheap in China and very, very expensive in Europe, then people will buy gold from China and sell it in Europe. This has been the case for hundreds of years. It's only because of the interconnectivity of markets that we've been able to have these modern currency exchanges, but the principle abides. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, the principle absolutely abides. I'm just commenting on the fact that our money has basically been worthless for the past hundred years. Titan's bow tie. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the same as Rome. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to invoke Rome, but Rome did debase their currency. And yep. we are debasing our currency in response to complexity. Mm -hmm. Peter Turchin, I think, wrote a great book on the history of societies and complexity. And what we're seeing now is a crisis of complexity. 
And uh, as Mark will know, because he studies economics, there's a marginal return that is diminishing marginal returns on complexity solving. So the more money we put into innovation, the less we get out of it. Because mm -hmm. as we innovate more, the um, benefits of innovation become imperceptible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what you've also found is like during the 2008 crisis, economies that were developed, classes developing, uh, suffered very little in most cases because their economies were a lot simpler and thus they, you know, they didn't suffer this sort of tragedy of complexity. Exactly, exactly. Maybe they have and declined the now, but that's been the largest oil crash. They, did, that's been they, declined, because, they declined because of uh, investment cycles. It took, it took two or three years for that investment cycle to end. That's why you seen in 2010, you started to see no, yeah. flipping, you know. I, I disagree with that on the macro terms. The, the, the macro cycle isn't an investment crisis, it's a complexity crisis. It's not a spiritual crisis or a political crisis, it's a complexity crisis. And as I said, Peter Turchin has a great series of books on this, that is in fact the complexity that we use to solve problems sows the seeds for our downfall. We sow the wind and we reap the whirlwind. But I think you're, ta you're talking like turbo turbo, like there's a bird's eye view, there's an airplane view, and you're talking like I'm observing this from another galaxy view. Like I, I think you're, you're no, talking no, no, to two I very different levels. No, I don't think so, because when you consider the decline of the West, we don't say the dot-com bubble was the decline of the West, even though it was a decline in the business cycle and economically. We mm. don't say that the housing crisis of the 1970s was the decline of the West. But we have this idea in our mind that there's some kind of decline. And one of the questions I want to put to you all is about Rome and the decline of the West, because people say that Rome is a part of the West, and yet Rome collapsed and the West abided. So how can Rome be a part of the West if Rome collapsed and the West survived? Well, I don't think the West, quote unquote, really existed when Rome existed. Yeah, the so West was Rome. That's a very I wouldn't put those, I mean, the, oh, the concept okay. of the West emerges with the, the schism and it only really, you only start seeing this term, quote, Western civilization or the West as people mean it today in the post-enlightenment world, mm -hmm. really. Yeah, and I'm, so are you saying that the history? Are you saying that the history of the West is the history of the Catholic Church? Yeah, that seems fair. Uh, yeah, I mean, pretty much because previously, it w in Europe at least, it was much more of a North-South divide. The South was basically civilized; the North was basically uncivilized, and it was as simple as that. Mm -hmm. I think it became after the schism you had this kind of conflict of. Um, well, I mean, it wasn't really necessarily a conflict. There was actually very low amount of conflict most of the conflict was actually into nicene in within the east and west but you had this split into orthodox and catholic blocks and then later it became the split between enlightenment and these sort of backward agrarian places like romania and russia on the edge of on the edge of expanding europe and to, i mean that well, was mirrored still, in the Cold War. Still, it still doesn't address it still doesn't address the problem of complexity I mean, do you accept the thesis that societies collapse because they become too complex and they can't sustain themselves because uh, of the marginal decrease? In some the, cases, the I think there are other diagnoses for the collapse of other societies. Could you elaborate on that? What are the other cases? Well, I don't know if we've got evidence that, the, for instance, the Olmecs died because their society was too complex. I think most, most point to possibly some kind of pandemic destroyed this. Oh, well, no, 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 no. As you know from being an economist, a pandemic or something like that is an exogenous shock. Yeah, yeah. So excluding... Are you talking about purely endogenous, endogenous, endogenous stuff? We're talking about endogenous. We're talking about endogenous, yes. Okay, so because that, the endogenous is the principle. Internally. Um, <sighs> crisis of complexity. The thing is, I don't know huge... I don't know probably enough about the decline of Rome to say... Obviously, the Roman system did suffer from a problem of complexity, as you see from the rise of the welfare state at the end of the Rome, where they were... What is it? I think it's olive oil, mainly. A lot of people put it down to bread, but it was more to do with olive oil that they were subsidizing at a ridiculous rate. Mm. Um, and and don't just... forget Diocletian, too, because Diocletian founded the feudal state because he tied people to their profession. He tied the peasants to his land, which was unheard of before that time. But the peasants were pretty tied to profession anyway, weren't they, before? They weren't tied to the land necessarily, but people typically inherited whatever their parents did. Well, that's, but it wasn't that's typicality. Uh, no, 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 point. 
the, the, sorry, sorry, just I didn't want to interrupt. I don't want to dominate the chat. But the point, the point is that about complexity is that you formalize the institution. Complexity is diversity with institutional control. Mm. So it's okay. the point that the state actually um, controlled that diversity. That's the point. Oh, yeah. So I you're not talking about complexity as complexity. You're talking about an overburgeoning state taking on a greater and greater share of the economy in everyday life. No, 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 no. I mean, would make things using, more complex, typically. I'm using, I'm using Peter Turchin's definition of complexity, which is complexity is the control and the diversification. You look at the um, one of his lectures he gives, he gives the example of, remember, the Beijing Olympics mm -hmm. and you had those drummers, but all of them were doing a very, very, all of them were doing the identical thing. They were all drumming. They were all doing the same thing and they had control, but that was not complexity. And he makes the connection between the American invasion of North Africa, which didn't have the control, but it had the diversity. It's about the diversity and the control. So for an, exa an example that we can give is that when something happens in industry, when there's a big pharmaceutical crisis or um, a, um, a, a, a pandemic or something like that, the government comes in and it sets up these institutions to control the pandemic. But in creating the institutions, it, increase, it, it, it increases control. It increases control and it increases complexity from increasing control. And increases dependency usually. Yeah. Well, at that point, it seems to me the yes, problem is yes, more yes. with control than anything, the centralization. Well, I don't think it's actually down to necessarily control. I think it, we should probably put that in caveats of, I think it's spheres of authority extending into areas that are not naturally built for them. So yeah, I, that, what, no, no, what I, came I, to mind for me immediately of what you said, Alex, was when the, I believe it's in the late or early 1700s, I believe this occurred, the, um, the Tsar, Tsarist Russia uh, eliminated the independence of the Russian Orthodox Church it essentially became almost a bureaucratic arm of the state. It was like a department. It was actually run by almost like a wheelhouse that was selected by the Tsar and not really by a priesthood. And at that point, you begin to see the decline in um, just uh, fervor for the church at the, at the low level, which is why when in the very early 1900s, when um, mandatory church service for military conscripts was ended, nine tenths of them, stop turning up because the church had no, become this sort of vestigial bureaucracy and it wasn't i think i think what you're trying to do is you're trying to turn this conversation into a semantic conversation about the difference between authority and control and we both agree there is a difference between authority and control but this is just generally when when turchin used control he just means the sort of it includes authority and control it just means the state organizing things in a way with a um diversity in the economy and i mean people in the comments people in the comments have said economics with the um you know with the jew thing you know the um uh, uh, the <laughs> but they should read distributism they should read distributism there's a great book by the american chesterton society called the hound of distributism and you can read hilaire belloc and i think pius the 13th and um uh, uh, uh belloc and chesterton and, you know, they, they put forward a third way, almost, beyond capitalism and socialism. Well, so did Ottmar Spahn, yeah, this is... And, and the, point, the point is, people complain about economics, but you cannot escape economics. You can't escape it. It is a fact of life. You can't, you, there's no way of getting around it. You can't say that it's some kind of Jewish science that we can ignore. Every single act we do is an economic decision. But do you think that in itself, that we view it that way, is a degeneration? In fact, no, that we've, no. we've, it's almost a lot like what Genon said about the, uh, you know, the sciences like chemistry, etc. The way we view them today has been a degeneration, and in fact, we've made economics complex. No, no, no. I've, I've written, I've written, I've written about this before, Mark. I've written about this before in my 2016 Edge of the Abyss. That it's not that you accept economics because every single economic theory is defined by something that is external to it it's whether or not a certain class in society is dominant and whether or not the bourgeois class is dominant over the warrior or the priest caste and the mm. point of distributism is to put the priest above the merchant but to still accept economic theory because it's a very very cheap it's a very cheap and easy way to say that economics is a jewish science and we can ignore it as imperial aspirations just said in the chat it's very cheap 
to just say that we can get rid of economics and not consider it because all of us are economic agents if you say that I'm not going to live without I'm, I'm not going to live with um, fancy food or fancy wine I'm going to live on bread you still have to make the bread you still have to buy the bread you still have to be oh, yeah, no, I, I don't think I don't think anyone would deny that people have to make economic decisions and were have been making them since the dawn of humanity that's that's simply the case well uh, once again I, I think you're you're talking alexander you're talking at a level that's like extra galactic and you're thinking like macro over the scale of eons meanwhile i think most of us are talking down here at like uh like i don't know what is the extent of capitalism or should we extend international capitalism versus and, ex and go with uh restrictionism for International capitalism, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. You're talking very, very in the macro scale. I think we're talking on a much smaller oh, well, scale. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll define. I'll define what I'm saying by um, expanding three cycles. There's the extremely macro. There's the macro and the micro. The hmm. extremely micro is the 13th century with the commercial revolution. And in the commercial revolution, we move from a labor economy to a usury economy. We move from people being defined by their social constituents, that is, people being defined by their relationship to their society, to people being free agents. And one of the implicit assumptions of capitalism is that everybody is a free agent and they can sell their labor on hmm. the market. That is the macro scale. We start from the 13th century that develops in the Renaissance with double entry bookkeeping and usury. I'm writing an article on w, um, WCR, which people can read, which I'll publish tomorrow or the day after. That's about usury. The macro scale is about the general century or generational um, change of capitalism, which is sort of the um, you know depression to depression. And the micro is the sort of eight to 10 years business cycle. And the point that you need to understand is that these are intrinsic to man. Mm -hmm. Man is an economic animal. And these cycles are a part of nature. Just as the generational cycles, as um, Strauss put in the fourth turning, these cultural cycles are uh, there. But, but the point is that you need to uh, assimilate. I mean, people say economics is a trash to a science, but you need to um, synthesize economics with religion and politics. Which is thing, what Mark is trying to do is what I'm trying to do. Yeah, Alexander. The thing is, what what you're you're not really factoring in here is just corruption. I mean, it, this is all theoretic stuff, and it's nice to sit and talk about the theoretics of everything. But at the minute, uh, it's already tied down. You know, we're we're playing Monopoly here, and they've you know the board's already dominated by one, you know, one group of people. When so, I mean, we can hang on, hang on. We can sit and talk about that. What do you what do you mean the by corruption? Government. How do you define that? Well, it's just, I mean, for example, people don't get any resource. You know, you're not starting out with any resource. There's nothing. You get nothing. You do. And then, so you've got to compete with people who have got resource. You know what I mean? That's the no, way no, no. I, I, no, no, I, I disagree with that. You do start with resource. You start with human capital. Some people are born intelligent and some people are born unintelligent. Some Trust me, mate, not in Northern Ireland, not in Northern Ireland, you don't, you've got nothing. You know what I mean? You've I think you're talking about the lack of no, no, no. the no. lack of a feudal structure in which you do have, I mean, I, I would agree that today you sort of, you do end up a sort of a wage cuck. Whereas in the past, and what I think um, Quidus Veritas is actually talking about in the chat is, you know, you had this non-systemized type where things weren't acknowledged necessarily but you did have a kind of economic system which was yeah, but that, um, that, that's, that, the thing is the thing is i don't know why it's an argument because that's exactly what i said about the long-term macro cycle is that people were defined by their sociological position they were yes. defined by their position in society and now they are not and they haven't been defined by that since the 13th century since the commercial revolution so i think that's what you're trying to say yeah really you'd, you'd put it all the way back to the 1300s I put it back to the commercial revolution, yes, because that was the original death of feudalism. Because you saw people then becoming freemen, people that were selling, instead of um, people um, uh, uh, providing a gratis to their lord, they were um, being uh, uh, hired for rent, for yeah. money, because the elites were um, wanted to buy s certain goods from the Silk Road. And they needed coin to use that. They needed a means of exchange. So instead of um, uh, uh, taking a share of the corn, 
from their peasants. They hired their peasants for a wage in order to buy certain goods from merchants. So all of that starts in the 13th century. And even and you can read my article, Mark, which I'm going to publish, about usury. And the usury laws change in the 13th century. There's a huge change. All over Europe? All over Europe. It starts from the northern Italian city-states, Venice, Florence. Busted. Yeah, so Florence on. is the big one. Uh, I would put it in the 1500s when the uh, papal edicts changed on usury. That's when I'd look at that. Well, what's the change? Because the, paper, the ecclesiastical law from the 9th century to the 12th century was that any lending at interest was usury. But yeah. then it changed. It changed in the middle of the 13th century that it was only um, lending at consumption at 12%. And businesses from the 12, 1230s to the 1330s, the interest rates for businesses in Venice went from 20% to 5%. So now businesses my... could... Businesses, okay, no, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Businesses could lend, businesses could borrow, sorry, um, at 5% in the 13th century, and they would contravene the usury laws. So what you're trying to say about usury, I identify as beginning in the 13th century with the change of the ecclesiastical law. Well, I, I agree with the ecclesiast uh, ecclesiastical law. Um, I probably just got the date wrong. I'm locating in the 15th century, you're putting in the 13th. Mm -hmm. So I probably just have the dates wrong. But the 13th was the, um, the Commercial Revolution. There's a great book called The Merchant in the Medi Medieval Europe by um, Peter Spufford, which you should read. It's fantastic. Mm. And it totally outlines this. It, the, 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 the effect of... I mean, it, it builds into the fact that in the Fourth Crusade, the um, Crusaders attacked Constantinople instead of the Muslims. And you have to ask, why did they do that? And one of the reasons was because of the Commercial Revolution. Hmm, interesting. Sure. Yeah, I'm actually reading uh, Usury in Christendom right now, which is a treatise on uh, usury in the Middle Ages. Yeah, Zippy, Zippy Catholic, mm -hmm. who's a pretty prominent blogger in the React Sphere, has written extensively about usury. I will one day go through it all because he's he's studied it quite in depth and has talked about all the sort of the ways people try to get around it and how they're legitimate or not legitimate and. You know. Yeah, it, it is dreadfully interesting. I just I wish I knew what his position on anything other than usury was, because typically he just he just seems like a bitter contrarian. I like the guy. Don't get me yeah. wrong, but yeah, he does dis he does like to disagree with people. I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is the kind of guy when someone says, "Well, the Earth is round." Well, actually, yeah. <laughs> but I do I do like the stuff he's written on on usury i think it's very academic in a kind of the way the same way steve sailor is academic on hbd for example yeah yeah absolutely. but isn't isn't it interesting that uh, pope francis went to the um uh, national association of anti-usury or something like that in 2014 that's an actual he association said, he said yeah <laughs> it is and i said it sounds be like something i'd make up It'll be, it'll be, it'll be in my article. But he said that usury was inhuman, and the U word has come back. The usury word has come back into the public consciousness. Isn't that just fascinating? The fact that in the nineteen eighties and nineteen nineties, everybody was trying to get on the yucky train. You know, in America, you had people like Donald Trump making their millions out of usury, and in the UK too. And now it's come back into the public consciousness as a sin, which it always yeah, was. The thing is here, he's he's calling that a sin because I think he's pro-communist. I think I honestly think that guy's pro-communist. I mean, well, he's I not think, usually think usually can be okay, you know, in certain circumstances uh, if it's a bit you know regulated and stuff. But dude, like I think communism, no, 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 hang on, hang like on. the Pope wants isn't good, you know. You need to you need to define what usury is because this is something I go into the article that usury the definition of usury has changed over time. I mean, do you see loaning fundamentally as a rent of money over time? Well, you, usury just to me would mean, uh, I think usury you would associate with like exploitational loaning. It wouldn't even be, I mean, you know, for example, if you were to lend somebody money and there was a bit of an interest rate uh, on it just to cover inflation or something, I mean, that would be... But hang on, hang on. Uh, I, think, I, mean? I think what you said... What, well, what you said is very, very important. Very, well, what you said is very, very important because you've said if you loan a person money. So, do you see that loaning to an individual as opposed to an enterprise is usury? Because loaning to a firm, 
because it's an investment and the firm will make a profit and you'll get a dividend from that profit. Mm. That's okay. But if you loan to a person for consumption, that's usury because that's exactly what the, con the, the debate was in the 1300s. Which would include a mortgage. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It would include a mortgage, yes. So we need to be very, very clear on our definition of usury. Isn't it weird how there were no mortgages in the 1200s? <laughs> yeah, go figure. But nobody writes, ah, oh, well, had a shit yeah, mortgage. Doesn't the term mortgage have... Like the term, the root mort has to do with death. Like it's your death, it's like a death pact or something like that. God, I wouldn't be surprised. Like mort? Yeah, it's well, something... it's, it's in there. I can only imagine it comes from that. Yeah, I think I read something about that once. But anyway, carry on. Well, if, it, if that's not the case, it probably should be. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I, but, but, that's a... Oh, to go on. Usury is an absolutely fascinating subject because if we look in the Islamic world, they ban any lending at interest, any lending at interest. So if you lend to a firm, you're not allowed to pay interest. If you lend to an individual, you're not allowed to pay interest. Mm -hmm. And what we really need to grind towards is a definition of what usury is because, you know, Do you agree with the Islamic is, conception? No, 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 I don't. I don't. No, I don't you don't. Okay. Well, I do. If, I do. I take a hardcore problem, stance on usury. Because no, I, no, I don't. The they the, do have exceptions because they've the problem, got Islamic the problem, banks that work around it, but I don't know exactly no, no, how that no, no, works. No, no, no. The, 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 problem, the, problem, the problem is compound interest. That's the problem. It's not lending because Thomas Aquinas and others, as I say in my article, agreed that lending money. You could pay an interest, you could charge an interest to a consumer or a company or a firm because they're renting the use of the money, which you could have used for profitable enterprise. Now, see, that I, was once not again, in contention. I, I disagree with that. If we think of if we think of money as a thing instead of this, uh, I think Zippy says it's a uh, it's an anti realist view of money that you've got. If we think of money like a thing that you use as a simple medium of exchange, it's like let's say I lend you a shovel for a month because you're redoing your you're really re landscaping your lawn. Uh, why should I expect anything more than the shovel back in good condition or a new shovel? If because you break because it? we are. I'd like I'll a tell, shovel and a trowel. Tell you why. Yeah, exactly. No, 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 yeah. I'll why tell, why, why should I expect anything more? I'll tell, I'll tell you why, because if you were a farmer and you had, I'll change the shovel to a plow because it'll fit my analogy, and you lend a plow to somebody else, imagine that you could produce five bushels of grain with that plow, okay? And in the time that you lent to somebody else, you could have made five bushels of, of, of wheat, yeah. okay? And you lend that to somebody else, then you would demand at least five bushels of wheat back, and because you've lent them, the plow for a certain amount of time, you would demand an interest on that because the interest is a payment for the risk because they might not even make four or three bushels of grain but and, or wheat. They the might make zero. It's, a, it's an you're opportunity cost. You have interest. It's the, you're it's charging the someone for an opportunity cost. cost, which actually isn't a cost. That's uh, that's part of the issue. Well, I, wouldn't they say that the issue no, is no, that you don't, instead, unlike the plow incident, where you could, you know, that would be in like a barter economy, wouldn't it? Where you could say, I can reasonably in good, good knowledge predict that I could farm this with this plow. With money, you can't necessarily, especially with investment, you can't necessarily say how much interest you should be charging because you have no idea what you could have done with that money. It's completely speculative. Exactly. Well, here, yeah. Can I just give a, a oh, wee example? Know. Yeah, okay, can. I. I mean, I, I collect coins, you know, like some med, medieval coins and, uh, you know, condor tokens and whatnot. And I mean, there's a really uh, direct example I can give you here. For example, if I was to borrow uh, a condor token from a friend to make a YouTube video and I was going to get money from this YouTube video, uh, say if I was, you know, uh, done a video saying, well, this was, you know, from England in 1798, whatever, you know what I mean? Uh, Basically, uh, he, uh, you know, I know there's going to be money coming off this, and then he's he's giving it to me with the risk of not getting it back or I lose it or whatever. You know what I mean? So there, you could, there's actual a, qu a quantitative uh, amount that could be put on that. I mean, you know, I mean, he, I can go to him saying, right, I've got this amount of money off these these videos, you know, and all that, like you know. And then, well, at that point, that would be a capital say, investment on his part. But the issue is, is that. 
you can't in good faith, I think, charge someone for speculation. That's the thing. You're charging someone for a opportunity cost, which isn't a cost. An opportunity doesn't actually exist. Like, for instance, if I have a dollar and I have to choose between a Snickers and a Twix, if I choose the Twix, I don't lose a Snickers. No, but well, that, I mean, that's you true. Do, when, you, really. when you pay for things, you don't pay an opportunity cost on the item. that You couldn't, you know, you could have used the money to buy something else, for example. But that's just but, it. But the point, the point, the point is about investment. It's like you see, if I made it, if I made it, like took a picture of your, like this guy's coin, and I made a T-shirt about, you know, a T-shirt of it, and started selling the T-shirts, mm -hmm. the the actual image of the the coin on the T-shirt would reduce the value, and you know, or reduce the the actual value of the coin, because people would be less interested theoretically, or it might increase the value of the coin because maybe people would want to see the actual coin that made this T-shirt. Do you know what I mean? Well, once again, you're no, talking I, I don't. theoretically. I don't, I, don't know. I don't know what you mean at all. Well, I mean, the coin itself might increase in value because, say, say Beyonce gets one of the T-shirts with a picture of the coin on it. Um, that, that could, that, that increase could really value. increase it. Well, it wouldn't increase the value of the currency. In a, in no, but that particular coin, I mean, that coin might, it might, it might do. I mean, for example, no, if it, it was wasn't. In the 80s, it, 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 it would increase I, the demand for the T-shirts, but it wouldn't increase the value of the currency. Or no, I, the I disagree. I have a, I have a concrete counterexample, actually. There is a certain firearm that was used in um, the first Tomb Raider movie with uh, Angelina Jolie. Yeah, and, that's true. Yeah, it's, AR-15s like an, as well. No, no, no. Uh, it's like an HK USP match or something like that. I th it was used by like some shooting sport. They Hollywood managed to get uh, this gun to use in the movie, and then everyone bought up all the remaining copies of that gun and there were only like a thousand of them in circulation so but that's actually the reality of the modern economy that you wouldn't have no, no, anything no, no. like that happen well, way what back you're trying way. to do is you're, you're conflating you're conflating fiscal policy with demand and what you're talking about is an excess demand but uh, what i mean is if you printed the coin on a t-shirt it wouldn't change the value of the currency uh, the denomination of the currency no yeah. no no exactly i don't, I, I don't think, think that's what he's arguing though economy. Yeah, that's, well, I mean, what, what I'm what I'm saying is is a particular coin because obviously coins, uh, you know, there's only a certain mintage value. There's, I mean, specifically specifically historical coins. You know, what I mean, because you can't really make a you know a new one. So there's no, you know, that market's closed. You know, there, there's no. Uh, yeah, you new... can't spend a denarius. You know what I mean? Like I can't give like a denarius for like a burger. So that I think that issue that you're bringing up there. Yeah, they're just uh, antique, Alice. Yeah, I, I think that issue that you're bringing up there is kind of is kind of irrelevant. Is this me you're saying? No, not, no, no. Uh, I, uh, Northern, you're you're fine. The issue that Alex, I, that I think he was bringing up, is a category error in this instance. I just don't oh, understand okay. the point. I, I just don't understand the point you're trying to make about the coin on the T-shirt. I mean, what's that about? Well, it's basically what it is. It's a, it's the variables, you know, um, and, and the profitability, and and the the idea of exploitation, and then the idea of closed closed and open markets and uh, I mean, there's certain closed markets. For example, a coin from 1700 can't be made again today. So there's not going to be any inflow. You know, there's there's a whole range of different uh, variables there. You know, and sliding scales and and opinions and all the rest of it. You know, we are so far oh, off nice. in the weeds. <laughs> we are so far off in the weeds. This so the is point, the point about user, never getting out. The point. The, Wait, the point about here. <laughs> The point about usury is an important um, theological concept because it, the definition of usury has changed over time. And it's important to really drill down to what usury is. Is it lending at interest or lending at compound interest? And one of the um, theories that I put forward is that usury is really about compound interest because Aquinas and other um, you know, um, uh, canonized thinkers believe that usury with non-compound interest was appropriate because as you lent for prow for a plow you lent for money plow for a certain rate and you borrowed money for a certain rate but the problem is compound interest because you're not being paid for what you have or what you owe but you're being paid for something that you don't actually have yourself so again that's the important thing about usury is whether or not usury is about compound interest or linear interest uh, I disagree. Yeah. I think I'll join you in the extragalactic perspective. I think uh, 
any lending of money at interest is usury, as it was oh. up until the 13th century. Yeah, I, I take a hardcore stance on that. Okay, that okay. The earliest conception that would be yeah. right. Yeah, that's okay. we're, yeah. We're going back right back to uh, the BC times, back uh, Old Testament style. So you well, so you think that uh, you, you agree with Aristotle that money is sterile fundamentally, that it doesn't contain value, that money is used as a means of exchange. Correct. Well, money does contain some value. I mean, uh, exactly. melt money yeah. down for it, for yeah, the point of exchange. Well, here for for one as an as a new new, new mesmerist, I know for a fact even even something that's completely. Uh, devoid of material value uh you know even you know like we of a certain material even something cheap uh, can can get cultural value um over time you know as i, I made that example of the t-shirt you know uh, and then the the idea of goodwill as well the business idea of goodwill uh, and that, that applies to numismatics that applies to coins as well so it's like there's but, but no way to argue Hang on, hang on. Do you think that goodwill means foregoing a profit? If you invest with the um, expectation that you're going to receive a certain profit, does the goodwill mean that you're willing to no, forego no, the profit? No, but the, the, the business it? concept of goodwill can, I mean, goodwill is obviously it's applied to organizations generally, but uh, that could be applied to a piece of numismatic, uh, uh, you know, uh, just a, a coin even one coin could have a, a certain goodwill factor just it, again it uh, the goodwill factor is just it's uh, it's recognizability um you know uh, who knows about it uh, then a cultural links with it maybe it's got like a uh, you know like for example nazi stuff or you know all the swastikas and you know recognizability uh, historical value and then, oh, yeah, and then mat right. material value value Mm -hmm. That is very interesting, yeah. but I mean, I, I want to hear what your thoughts are. I'm going to stop talking for a little bit, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on something I wrote about that I tried to synthesize, gay, as I said in the podcast, uh, plebeian podcast, about that I tried to synthesize gain on and economics, that every caste has its own understanding of wealth, and that yeah. only the bourgeois create wealth through capital accumulation, that the priest class the priest caste, sorry, use wealth to achieve spiritual goals. The um, warrior caste, like in ancient Rome, use it for pillage, and they don't create wealth, they just simply steal wealth from other parts of the world, which is what the Roman Empire did. And it's, uh, the slave caste, the slave caste, the lowest caste, seek to distribute the wealth that the bourgeois have created. And it's only the bourgeois that actually create wealth. What do you think about that? Do in you include of... uh, Sudras as slaves? Oh, well, the well, thing is, Gaynor, Gay, Gaynor never really wanted to use this as a totally um, uh, parallel comparison between the West. You want to use it as a sort of metaphorical comparison. Oh, okay. So when also, I use the Sudras, I use it as Gaynor would have used it. Also, how are you defining bourgeois? Would you count something like uh, carpenters, candlestick maker, butchers, beggars, candlestick? No, 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 moving towards the Marshallian era of economics. So it's trading, right? This is people who move stuff again. around, they don't make anything. In, in, in the classical theory, in the classical theory, I'm going to have a cigarette in a minute, so I'm going to leave you in a minute just for five minutes. <laughs> but the point is that in the classical physiocratic theory, that is, before, which is Locke, Hume, Turgau, Carnet, they all believe that the economy is a pie. And Carnet wrote his economic table, and he said that um, agricultural industry was productive. Industrial industry, as we call it, just productive industry as we know it, is actually siphoning off part of the wealth that already exists. In Ricardian terms, in, Smith, in Smith's terms, and the classical and neoclassical economists, they believe not that they take a slice of the pie, but they increase the size of the pie through capital accumulation. And it's that increase in the size of the pie that I define as bourgeois. Okay, so that that would include people who create wealth. And I define wealth as something for which someone is willing to pay. So, I don't know, it, uh, yeah. factory owners, people like me, machinists, uh, furniture makers, people who make things that people want to buy and give money for. 
So, so do you believe in it? So hang on, hang on. Do you, you think there's an absolute wealth or relative wealth? Uh, no, there's, well, technically there's only a certain amount of stuff on the planet. So obviously there is an absolute wealth, but in practical terms, no. Uh, no, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, no, 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 I, I, I don't really understand what you mean. This is really, really important in economic terms. Oh, do you I, think I'm, there's I'm an implicit, do you, do you think there's an intrinsic wealth to certain goods, or do you think that the wealth that goods have is from external subjective understandings? Oh, no, I think it's externally subjective. So, I, I so you believe in a subjective, uh, Hayekian, Austrian view of wealth? Yes, yes. Mm, I oh, I don't know. See that, that that's so important because that's a contention. But I'm just going to have a cigarette. I'll let you guys talk because I'm sure. sorry. I do tend to dominate conversations, <laughs> as we have seen. <laughs> no, this is good stuff, though. Uh, no, I, I don't buy into the uh, the notion that. Um, well, obviously, we've seen this. Cars have become. Uh, they obviously change in value. There's no. There's no set value. That, to that's anything. true. That's true. But what about? Maybe I'm conflating incorrect things. What about the value of a cathedral? Um, well, it depends. Things you can't put a price on. You can't say it has, you, you kind of have to abstract an economic value. Because like, I, I believe put... in objective beauty is the thing. Oh, I do too. I believe too. that beauty is absolutely objective, but how does beauty relate to price? Well, because often people will interpret wealth as how beautiful something is. I know that's hard to imagine in our era where people pay money for paint canvases that have had people have their periods on them but yeah. you know it pe previously at least before the contemporary well, that's, like, yeah, guys, paid that's for the, the beauty of, of things that's the value of signaling mm. or in the case of uh, <laughs> is that value objective <laughs> no no that's well, entirely guys, subjective no guys, i think yeah. i think monetary value is subjective it's a yeah, matter yeah. something's value monetarily is something is the price for which someone is willing to pay i mean if you for example like, if you're talking about a cathedral uh, for example, if you look at that recent one in France that was knocked down there, there's a, there's a whole load of in inputs here. Uh, one of them is how much money do people have spare uh, from what's going on in the economy. Another one is, you know, culturally, what's the well? What, you know, how how much is the the value of the well to for people to keep that cathedral? And then yeah. culturally, culturally, how how like uh, how aware are people of that problem? Then that that that's another input. You know, I mean, what what you have to do is each each thing has all these different layer inputs, um, and then obviously they affect the the ultimate the well. Uh, you know, the collective well. It's yeah, a bit like I mean, that's quite a particular example, I think, because that's that's almost a, a communal. But that's the example uh, he brought payment. up, and, and I could I could give you. Yeah. I mean, if you tell me another example, I'll give you the inputs on that other example. You know, and that's the way it r runs all. Yeah, like no, that. I'm just saying that in my specific cathedral example is quite. I I I think it's interesting to bring up like these issues where a community, you know, that you you can't afford to upkeep on a huge building. It doesn't have to be a cathedral. You know, it could be something else. Um, but the people then have to decide. Okay, do we shell out for it because they're not buying a product there? They're effectively paying a tax, really. They're paying yeah. a tax to have a, something available to them that is a public good um, that they oh, can wow. observe and enjoy and get something from. Um, That's the thing. I, I think the calculation might be different if you're actually purchasing something. Yeah, but we can't put that in, like we can't put the the value of like we can abstract it and figure out proxies for. It, but like, what's what's the value of um, women not voting? I mean, I, I think we all agree here that women voting is a terrible, terrible thing. At least they're reactionaries among Yeah, us. but when you ask what's the value of it, what, a monetary value? Yeah, exactly. So, like, how, how would you go about I don't think the question this makes a category error. I don't think you can, you can answer it. And that's it's exactly like asking what, that's how exactly much what I'm is saying. religion worth. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. I think... Uh, so you think beauty as, is the same? No, I think beauty can be measured objectively. I think monetarily... It it's, can be, okay. Yeah, it, it's just the nature, it's the nature of money. It's that people have more of it than others, and their prices, th things, they're... Prices, there are things that people are willing to pay some price for and other people aren't. Like, I would pay uh, $50 for five little tiny Warhammer 40,000 miniatures. Most people I know would not. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Can I, can, I, can, I, can I be heard? Am I sure. heard? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Hi. Um, I, I think it must be a, uh, an un, un untangleable uh, mixture of or or sort of interaction of, of both objective and subjective 
um, criteria. I, I I can't see it as. I mean, you get these kind of you know the bur the burn victims were like, well, the, you know, the economy is just a game, so we can just do whatever we want with it and and turn it into you know what we want. Well, yeah, yeah it is a game in a way. It's something that's uh, in play. But if you start messing with it, you start messing with it because the game has rules yeah. and there are uh, expectations that, you know, these, 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 this wealth that I have has a certain value and you start playing with the game, then that wealth can either be uh, suddenly become greater than it was or more likely it's going to crash. So in, it seems to me there must be a complex interplay of both subjective and objective realities and some some subjective criteria once it's in play is actually now objective because now it's part of yeah. the rules of the game it's part of the the conditions that we're playing under this is me just just shooting shit from somebody who's completely ignorant <laughs> but just well, like my I understanding of life in general is that even when we talk about beauty it is a mixture of objective and subjective realities. I mean, there is certainly a kind of objective beauty. You can measure it uh, mathematically. You can compare it to the golden mean. You can do, you know, find other ways of yeah. looking at it, how it might relate to uh, fractals or something like this. Obviously, there are um, elements that are, you know, it's kind of hard criteria. But ultimately, some people are moved by it and some people aren't, even the most beautiful of things. Mm, but that that's a matter of taste and taste goes to the same matter of uh, monetary value to me like there are people who would not pay any amount of money for a really nice painting even if it's really good and it's something they like they just wouldn't pay any amount of money for it there are people who would pay a lot of money for really terrible paintings have we as yeah. we have discussed I, so I think one of the one of the problems is when you're talking about monetary value you're looking for a, like an actual sort of numeric value on something and I think that's exactly. very difficult to say because, like you said, you've given examples of things that fluctuate in value over time that are worth different things to different people. Some people pay such and such an amount, some people won't, and that's you know, that's all to do with indifference curves and what people are, it, what combinations of goods are indi people indifferent towards. But I do think that you can you can actually have an objective sense of whether something is or is not valuable. Uh, I think so. Maybe not so. quantifiably, but there are th certain things I think that if you would say if somebody put a value on them, that person would be mentally ill. For instance, if somebody, you know, you've heard these crazy stories about like celebrities pregnancy tests and there are weirdos who will buy them off the Internet. And there are people who will buy like the used tissues of celebrities you, and things. Here, Mark, people do can not objectively have, do not say that that stuff? is not valuable. Do you not have anything like that? I don't have any celebrities use tampons. Lip's sake, man, you're not cool, like. Yeah, right, I've got like four. <laughs> I've got Bruce Jenner's pregnancy test. Well, like excrement and things like that. There are things that I think most people, it, universally, people hold don't have any kind of value. Yep. They just well, don't. Well, but doesn't this, doesn't this bring into the idea of uh, the notion of relics? I mean, but they don't have... They they don't have a an economic value, but they have a another kind of value. I mean, I know the the relics of of Madonna I don't consider to be valuable. Okay, but, but the relics are said to do things. That's one of the jewels of relics, right? Relic. Why do you go and you know pilgrimage to a relic? It's not just a look at it. You know, people want to touch relics because they believe some sort of energy transfer happens. That's what happened in the, you know, back when there were a lot of fake relics flying around Europe. You know, people would go to see them because they think that touching these nails would uh, give them blessing and give them protection from evil spirits. That's the va that's the real sort of value of a relic, I think. And I don't think you could say that about modern examples of weird things bought off eBay. No, 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 no. They're just sort of curiosities of people who are mentally ill. Yeah, that sounds about right. People who are obsessive and just want these things for some reason. Yeah, if you, I mean, you could trick somebody into thinking that those things had special powers or abilities, but that would just be a con. It's not <laughs> like a real objective. Like like Joe Owens' video camera, you can see through people's minds. <laughs> what? I don't think we need to bring Joe Owens into this. Oh, so you have to, Joe Because he will be coming. after us very, very quick doing <laughs> oh, a video oh, denouncing oh, reactionary true. Ian's hangout and the, you know, Good you're all God. in an intellectual playpen going nowhere <laughs> around around doing these three hour bloody hangouts, <laughs> knocking on doors. What's going on? <laughs> okay, is. thank you. So is the criteria for, for something having value that it is going to be wanted to be used by 
it has number. some a greater use. number of people. Well, it's demand. I mean, so what, whether that demand is, you know, cured meat. I'm eating some salami right now. That has a other than for vegetarians, that has a high use value for a, you know a, a large number of people. A beautiful painting has less, but I mean, we, you, I think here we wouldn't say that. Um, well, we we're not distinguishing has no has uses. no value. What's that? Yeah. It's just what? use is different. It's use what? What and I think you're, I think you're going is way up Maslow's way up Maslow's hierarchy. Well, yeah, of so. course, but you're um you're going too far down the chain. It's the idea of desire and willingness, what you're willing to give to acquire it. You're going further than that to practical uses. Uh, it for me the subjectiveness of value is entirely dependent on what someone is willing to do to get this. And what, what someone is willing to do is the overwhelming majority of the time is just pay for it. What someone is willing to pay. Well, I mean, what about the indifference to destruction as well? I mean, what about people who maybe do not see the beauty in a painting, but still would try to protect it from being destroyed, would not want to see it damaged or whatever? Um, I think that's an indifferent, like you said, it's an indifferent appreciation. Obviously, they don't, well, hold on. They don't value it for themselves, but they value the fact that it exists. And we see this with a lot of... Uh, but they think it will have value for others. Exactly. And that's in itself a, we make that kind of value judgment. And I think there are goods that we would actually not make that judgment for, that we'd be completely indifferent to them. Being yeah, absolutely. Sure. So I mean, you join us, Chip Alexander? Yeah, it sounds like yes. it is. Tasty, tasty stuff, like. <laughs> tasty, <laughs> tasty chips. <laughs> Oh, but that's um they hold it valuable enough that it exists but not willing not valuable enough to pay it so for instance they're willing to quote unquote buy that say painting or sculpture or whatever um so that it continues to exist but they're not willing to pay the zillions of dollars enough to own it themselves does that make sense yeah one example yeah. guys if i can butt in here is in northern no, ireland no, sorry, uh, is in northern ireland like uh at the tourist industry like you've got protestant and catholic uh taxi drivers for example who make a lot of money sort of ferrying tourists about around these like paintings you know have you ever seen these paintings and murals and everything mm -hmm. so i mean the for example a protestant taxi driver could actually even though he might hate the uh this catholic painting or something he makes money off that you know in a kind of like in a you know in a, a sort of a roundabout way because of the tourists and all you know so like that would be an example of you might hate a piece of art but you're still actually living off that to a certain degree or it's like it's another end feed you know well again so, again that's that goes back to what he's willing to pay to acquire uh he holds that in no value he holds his business in value and therefore he has to value but, this um, piece of art yeah no but that's that's fair. Also, also, uh, Oscar Wilde said that art is totally meaningless. It's totally useless. Did he like I mean, to stick his dick in young boys? Value, though? I mean, <laughs> what is the what is the value? What is the value of beauty? What is the value of love? You can't put some um, economic um, uh, quantifiers on art and beauty, can you? They are eternal values. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's been my point the entire time. Is that economic values entirely is largely subjective. Well, then I know Roger Scruton commented on that Oscar Wilde statement saying that, yeah, like something like beauty is is useless because it should it's not supposed to have a use. It's not supposed to be seen in utilitarian terms. Yeah, you can't eat beauty. Right. Like uh, I think it was tele uh, teleologic. I think you mentioned that uh, it's really high up on the hierarchy of needs or really low down. Well, are we saying that, like, in a traditional economic system, people wouldn't, you know, buy more than what they really needed, or they wouldn't necessarily have money to spend on frivolous things, or or they wouldn't even think about doing that? But again, in a traditional society, the point is that they were defined by their um, sociological place, and they were defined by their role in society. They weren't individualized economic agents. And that's a very modernist view, and that's a view that comes from the commercial revolution of the 13th century. The fact that people are deracinated. Instead of having lord and peasant, you have employer and employee. That all comes from the 13th century.
Well said. All right. <laughs> Not going to lie, I'm getting a headache talking about this kind of stuff. I, I, I think I'm punching way above my intellectual weight being part of this conversation. Oh, go on. I tell you what, you know, everything can be simplified, and I think, I think there there is there is a degree of like uh, uh, intellectual kind of, you know, uh, things could be simplified. I think, you know, I, I always believe in in the possibility of simplifying terms and even explaining terms. Because I think Alexander's uh, is obviously very knowledgeable. I mean, it wouldn't wouldn't hurt to simplify things or you know give. A bit of an explanation about I'm trying, I'm things. trying. I'm, okay, I'm trying. Sorry, I'm, I'm maybe I'm not being clear, but I said earlier in the um, hangout that there are, I'm trying to simplify it into three distinct cycles. There's the extremely macro, as you say, it's the galactic, which I quite like. I like that. I might use that in my articles. Galactic cycle, the galactic scale, yeah. And then <laughs> there's the galactic. I love my mark on Neo reaction, yes. And then there's the uh, macro scale and the micro, but the galactic is that all these problems, Evelyn was wrong, it didn't start in the Renaissance, it started in the high medieval period. So that's the that's the extremely macro scale. And then you imagine you have this cycle, imagine like a sine wave that you have, it goes from zero up and down, but on that trajectory, on that line, you have a um, wavering along that line. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. And then you have you have a sort of sine wave on that that goes up and down, up and down over that long term trend that goes up and down. And then on that line, on that sort of secondary line, you have another line that goes up and down, up and down, up and down. That's really what I'm trying to say is that you have cycles within cycles. Oh yeah, I agree with that. Mm. I but like I say, we're I mean, we're even kind of getting to the point where sort like sort of like 50 percent of the viewership here is being turned off you know we're devaluing ourselves here we need to get into these specifics what do you mean by these sine waves what's a sine wave <laughs> okay well a sine wave is mathematical but it distracts from the point which is that you have cycles and um you know you, you it doesn't you can't really understand a sine wave unless you understand mathematics but again i know people are being turned off but part of this is um no, no, I can understand. I can understand cycles and the idea of like a, a continuity and all whatever. But I mean, for example, a sine wave. Can you give a like a very simple example, like of what what a sine wave? Okay, well, when, wave. when you when you understand a cycle, you probably understand it as a circle. Now, yeah. take the circle and cut it into semispheres. Okay, so you've got an uh, uh, going up and down, and then you've got a going down and up. Okay, now flip mirror the bottom semisphere into left to right. Do you see? So you go up and down and then up again. That's that's really what I mean by a sine wave. I agree that's the only way like I say, man, I'm not really I don't even have I don't even understand what's going on with all that. Like it would be something <laughs> I'd have to look into, man, to be honest. I, I, I don't I don't understand anything about that. Okay, but the, the, the point the point the point the point the point I'm trying to make is that you have a business cycle on the short term and you have a larger generational cycle in the medium term and then in the extremely long term you have a cycle that goes from the 13th century up until the 21st that's what i'm really trying to say all right okay no well that's it i mean but i think a, a lot of that's like a there isn't really any cycle and, and again a lot of it wasn't quantified i mean we haven't had like a a quantified constant uh, you know data economic data coming in since the 13th century you know what i mean so how can you generate these you know these waves and all you know all that sort of thing is this kind of like a just a an allegorical wave you know or like a theoretical wave or what you know well it's it's the discovery of patterns like we About see the patterns of civilization we can we can assume that it's a pattern yeah but how can you study these patterns when you you can hardly you know what I mean? It just seems very fancy. Because, because uh, as I said, no, no, no. As as I said, I've said about three times in the in the, in the hangout that you move from a society where people are defined by their position in society to people being free agents and people owning their own labor. And all of Marxism is about reclaiming the value of your own labor. All of modernity. And all of um, bourgeois neoclassical um, capitalism is about selling the products of your labor on the market. Yeah, and all of so that, the, the, the very idea, the very idea of having your own labor that you can sell on the market comes from the 13th century. Yeah, well, the, well, I mean, the, the idea that it's yours, the idea that it's yours to, to sell, because obviously the conception in 
I, I mean, I think I've got this right. The conception in the uh, the feudal period would be that your labor is not yours. Mm -hmm. you well, you've that's... sold your labor. You've already given your labor at birth for your security and everything else that you are provided throughout your well, lifetime. What what happens here? This is it's, it's again. It's exactly. It's like buyers buyers to entry here. You know, uh, and the the labor market, just like the business market, has a, a, a system of buyers to entry again. Your labor depends on how many people the, the government's bringing into the country. If they're bringing loads of Polish people into the country to replace you, then you're obviously... So you're not actually in control of the, the value of your own labor. Well, uh, hang on, hang on. About When it comes to that, actually increasing the supply... I mean, when you a lot of people imagine that there's a supply and demand for labor. That, you know, uh, if there's an oversupply of labor, that the wages will decrease. But that's not necessarily true. And in fact, the Nobel Prize in no, 2010. Hear, hear me, I'd cut you off and say that is true. That I mean, that I can't. I can't understand how you can even say that. That's complete rubbish. To be honest. No, what I'm saying. I'm saying. It's not true. Like... If you if you, if you have an oversupply of labor, it doesn't necessarily depress wages. No, it not does, necessarily. It just typically. No, it does. Well, no, no, not. it doesn't at all. It doesn't. It doesn't. Labor, so, I mean, labor shouldn't be seen as a no supply way. and demand. It should be something. You know, if, if the growth of the population should track perfectly with the growth of the economic, because you've got one more person to work. It shouldn't be that you're basically. Oh, we have a demand for more workers. Where are we going to get them from? Well, the that, problem, that's the a problem. Should. Right now, we have artificial constraints placed on job creation. Well, because what you found now is that the business has exploded. There's loads more, you know, things to do. Well, at least there were before the onset of automation. I think that is starting to change things. But there were no people to fill these jobs. That's why people are coming from overseas. It's precisely because of that supply demand market. No, it's, not. it's it's because of it's because of uh, the European Union. It's because of regulation. It's because of these these. Uh, but that's just a vehicle. You know, that's just kind a vehicle for it. If there wasn't any work, look, why is there no inflow of migrants into Romania? Because there's no work say, there. No, there is a re there is there's 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 uh, you know probably sex tourists. I would imagine uh, an oh, inflow. Yeah, no, no, yeah, well, well, tourism is not the same. The tourism sex, is no, the sex, 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 I can, I can explain the sex tour. I can, I can explain the sex tour. The sex tourism comes from a depreciated currency. And if your currency is weak, then people from wealthy currencies that have a strong, sorry, people from wealthy societies that have a strong currency move to countries that have a weak currency yeah. and exploit the labor there because they can say that it only costs two dollars to have a i mean this, this is the weimar republic in the weimar republic americans would come to germany and it would only cost them two dollars to have a night with a prostitute because of the deficiency in the currencies but but sex tourism is a category error johns are not labor they're not employees the prostitutes no i know i know employees. and the problem, so, the problem the problem with labor the problem with labor is that everybody aggregates labor into one laborer but of course there isn't one laborer everybody has different skills and what you find actually that there isn't when you have a surplus of labor there isn't actually a depreciation of wages and the reason is that you have a mismatch of skills and one of the problems with globalization is that you have lots of different countries specializing in certain economic areas but they have a mismatch of skills so you can have but a specialization. You, I honestly, you practically speaking, I see a depression in wages. We see that now with the number of uh, masters, people with master's degrees serving me coffee at Starbucks. Yeah, well, no, 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 well, that's different. That's different. No, 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 that's different. That's, 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 that's different. That's different. That's different. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? <laughs> no, God, no, no, no. <laughs> no I, I don't want to get a lot of back there. Are you a refugee? Hang on, hang on. People with didn't say I work at Starbucks. No, people that people people that have a mismatch of skills. That's what you're talking about. But that's different to the depression of wages. Oh. Because when you talk about the depression of wages, you mean the depression of wages in certain skills areas. But the problem is not that we have a unified um, labor market and there's a decline in the wages in that unified labor market. The problem is a mismatch of skills, okay, and that so comes from globalization. Well, that's a different again, topic in time. You're still at the galactic scale. We're still talking. No, no, about he's talking not. Can I explain? Can I yeah, explain what this guy's saying here? What what he's saying is is that there's uh, low you know there's kind of like unskilled labour uh, there's too many unskilled labourers maybe coming in or there might be too many plumbers I mean I mean because 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 of the way that the education systems work in these places and then again it's another thing down to the culture people like for example in Poland people tend to train towards trades plumbing electrician blah 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 mm -hmm. so they're sending in people and then and then this is what Alexander's talking about is this mix mix match of skills so you might be having so many of these plumbers or so many of these electricians just because of the culture from Poland and whatever you know so there's 
there is all these inputs again. The way I, I simplify things, because I don't really work at this mad galactic level, I just sort of put, I always think about the inputs. Uh, and then, obviously, when you're working with the European Union, for example, this is kind of like an extra, uh, it's a body that just, uh, it's like got a god body, like, you know, that just does stuff and it, it opens doors and it does whatever. And, and it, well, it, look, it, look, it can look. ruin your life, like, you know, so it can't very quickly. The, 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 only, the only group of people that have had a decline in wages from immigration are the previous wave of immigrants. So way, uh, immigrants from 2014 are negatively impacted by immigrants from 2015. Okay, well, you see, I, I mean, I, I know that's not true because I, I, I know because I've worked. No, 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 no. You can go and read. Effective. I don't know. Where do you live, man? In America or something? Go and, no, 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 no. I live, I live in the UK, but you can read the point. The, the way that I'm basing this on is the Bank of England reports. And from... Oh, know, but that, oh, come other, on. That's uh, nonsense, man. That's, you know, you know that's nonsense. Bank but then, what you have to like? say, then what you have to say is that you base your entire view of economics on anecdotal evidence, which on is my, just not no. scientific at all. Well, you see, I work on a conspiracy, a conspiratorial basis, based on the fact that I know that the EU is corrupt and that there's the banks are corrupt and that they are. No, it's, no, 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 no. it's not. It's not well, nothing to do with that, the banks. That that basis, like, no, well, I work on that not, basis because I know that's the truth. The EU, the EU could be uncorrupt. It could be totally clean. The Bank of England could be totally clean. It doesn't change the fact that the only people that are really affected by mass immigration are the previous wave of immigrants. Well, that, economically, 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 yeah, exactly, no, 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 exactly, no, 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 they're, you know, they've got these like landlords uh, that are, uh, you know, 1990s Pakistanis and stuff, you know, and all this. But a lot of it's a, no a nonsense, you know. No, it's, it's, not nonsense. About, it's not about it's not about landlords. It's about skills. And a lot skills. of these jobs minimum wage anyway, so you can't really decline the well, way. I mean, that wage like, is set by the government. Like anybody, mm. everyone's in that mar in that minimum wage market now. It's like communism. I mean, I've got high flying. I've got no, high flying no, qualifications, but you can't. There's just no jobs to meet your qualifications. No, the different, the different. No, no, no. It's not. It's not. It's not the wages. The wages aren't declining through crisis. It's the hours that are declining through crisis. If you look through the 2007, 2008 crisis, people got their jobs back very, very quickly. The employment level returned to its equilibrium quite fast. But the difference was that people were going back into jobs that were part-time. And that's the difference. It's not so about people, wages. But people are still making... The practical effects of this is that people are still making less money. People are still worse off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotta say, I gotta say, loss of hours is is equivalent to a lower a, a, a lowering of wages. I may not be in yeah, exactly. unless, it's, it's, unless you can find something else. If you have enough money to time. feed yourself and, and care for yourself, yeah. that's a drop in wages. But so I think there's still only a very very underemployment, like you know, underemployment. That's what it's called. You know, but, 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 but the wages are still quite good. I mean, it's not an issue of people being necessarily poor. I mean, well, yeah, I mean, I mean, $20,000 an hour is a, is a great wage, but if you're only working one hour a year, you're only making $20,000, you know what yeah, I mean? I mean you're not, you're Alexander, you're not what working you, one hour man, What do you do? What do you do? Let, like, tell me what you do, because you're, no offense here, man, you're, you're not a working class geezer, like, you must have some no, sort no. of advantage, you know what I mean? No, yeah, I study, I study economics. Uh, well, that's it, man. You, like you say, you're living in a fantasy, mate, really. I mean, I, I, I live in a... <laughs> no, thank you, are, man. And the gloves have come off. No, I don't I mean, live I... in a fantasy, man. I mean, the, the, thing, well, is the, th the thing is that you really, really need to get about well, this Well, you see, you're, what you're doing is... is I mean, you've, you've quoted a load of stuff okay. to me there. You've quoted a load of stuff to me there. And to be right. honest, it's, it's, it's Bank of England. It's, it's, you know, this is Goldman Sachs. Well, no, 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 no. Hang on, hang on. No, the Bank of England. The Bank of you England. are Goldman no, no, Sachs. No, no, no. I've got to say, no, I've got to say, I've got to say. No, I've got to say, the Bank of England did an absolutely scathing report in 2014 about quantitative easing. Because quantitative no, easing just okay. sent money into the reserves. I mean, the Bank oh, of man. England are fairly. What that is, they that's are independent. Offset. That's offset in there, but no, I would never believe anything from the Bank of England. I wouldn't ever believe anything from any, anything, because it's just so corrupt. You know what I mean? Well, the no, the point, corrupt, point, the Bank of question. England is corrupt. Okay. Can I ask a question? The Bank of England, how does does this cover all of the UK or just England? It's the equivalent of your Fed. 
Okay. So it covers all. No, 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 no. Hang on, hang on. Bank no, 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 it's, it's it doesn't not... cover Scotland, though. Scotland has its own bank called the Bank. Although was Scot was Bank of Scotland put under the possession of something else? After the no, crisis? the Bank of Scot the Bank of Scotland's actually a, a private bank. It's not a. It's not a. a I mean, oh. the Bank of England is the UK's. Yeah. And it's Sorry, not equivalent to the Fed, as Alexander uh, is about to say. There, it's it doesn't have the same structure. It doesn't have the same. Um, you know, it, I mean, I'm sure it's say like, but it's a, it, it well, is a, a different, different, it's a monster. different setup of a country, but it's well, a different point, monster to the Fed. Like the point, the point I'm trying to make is that there isn't really an economic argument against immigration. Really, I mean, GDP per capita decreases and GDP increases, but the, uh, you need to get away from the economic argument because the whole argument is cultural. <laughs> It doesn't matter if they increase our GDP by 0.007%. It's about, you wouldn't trade 100,000 Pakistanis. Oh, I'd agree. I'd agree with that message 100%. Yeah. So you need to get away from the economic, because the stats don't actually support what you're saying. You, no, no, I, I, if, you're, if you're a Jewish banker, the more people in, the better. If you're a British person... Well, that's, that's what he's saying. It's lying in the street, you know. And that's, that's what he's saying. It's a cultural problem. Yeah, that's the problem. So, yeah, well, like, yeah you, I mean... You, and, you uh, make... Obviously, mass migration makes people more money. That's simply a fact. Oh, it does right. increase no growth. No doubt. That's a, it does massively increase growth. That's obvious. But well, GDP, obviously, what we're makes, saying yeah. is that that is that comes at the expense of the people who are already here, and we actually do have some claim to say, you know, the bourgeois actually doesn't get to make that decision because they are exactly. subject no, to so, so to summarize, Ale Alexander has been speaking very, 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 very times a thousand technically and precisely but i mean again back to what alexander here what alexander no, 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 said. On, alexander on, here one minute man one minute here you said my immigration doesn't depress uh people's wages i mean that's a, a complete nonsense it really is no no it's not it's not it's not and it you can is, read man, i mean like, i mean totally is, like, no, no 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 you can read, the re -read, read the, no, the nobel prize no no the nobel prize oh, the nobel prize barack obama like you know what i mean come on man yeah, no, well, let, 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 let him Look, say what he's gonna say irish okay i'm gonna say the point is that the effect on wages is negligible the only people that are damaged by mass immigration are the previous wave of immigrants. Are and you the saying their wages are affected? Yes. The wages of the previous migrant group are affected. Okay, how are yeah, they affected? None of the other not, wages. Not other people. Well, yeah. uh, because look, you can go and read our link to you, um, Mark. Um, no, but I'm I'm I'm, I'm saying to explain is, that because I think that's where the the disconnect is here. You're, you're saying the, no, 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 no. That's not where the disconnect. The disconnect is none of us are Thatcherites. None of us believe that there's no society. None of us believe that economic factors are the most important. One of the things that frustrates me. In, yeah, no, we all agree on that. We all agree on that. We agree with you on that. He's we talking stop, purely on the numeric level. Talking. Well, it doesn't, and we need to stop talking about depression of wages because it doesn't matter. Who cares if it depresses wages? What we need to focus on is that they are people from an alien culture, and they shouldn't be here. Yes, yes, well, yeah. I agree. Here, yes. here, 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 one second. There's, there's a, there's a few, there's a few end feeds here, and and one of them is the, the idea of the depression of wages again, again, monetary policy is, is, is like a. It's a fluid, a fluid market, and whatever. I mean, you, you know, the, the the theoretical depression of wages. I mean, you, you know, that quantitative easing could affect depression of, and, and there's all sorts of inputs. But another thing is, is, is again, is like, and something that you've seen in in the kind of uh, the 1800s and all that, and the industrial revolution was, uh, you know, uh, technologies and feed. You know, uh, you know, like uh, industrialization. Uh, like for example, European Union grants uh, buying uh, machines for industry, um, you know, and stuff like that, and then mm -hmm. European grants training people to repair machines that maybe you know would have got. Like for example, like uh, the agricultural industry in France uh, has got a lot of well, these. Yeah, it's very I mechanized. Mean, yeah, you know? I, th I think I think you're right. You're right. It is mechanized, and I'm can, totally can I, with you actually. Can I just put a bow around what what's been sort of said? Because I think we're going around sort of in circles here. Um, you, you, you've said that, um, based on the reports that you've looked at, that I have no doubt, you know, look, I'd look at them and draw the same conclusion from Bank of England or wherever else, uh, say that there has not been a depression in wages. Now, from the grounds eye view of, um, I can't remember your name, Irish guy, <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, no, no, no. 
Oh, here, excuse me. That's very insulting to me, the ground's eye view. That's why. That's terrible. You're saying that? No, I'm, I'm saying ground's eye view because you said you're working class, right? Uh, well, I, I, well, again, so you, I mean, you're again, saying it from class, an anecdotal so far as I am, your I'm wages are bad, me, I, right? I, you're I'm saying a, your wages are not good, yeah? I'll give you my an, uh, for around I, I went to a private, uh, you know, well, I suppose you call it public school or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm high, you know, high. So did I, by the way. I've got, I've got, you know, very high level qualifications. Yeah, uh, I've got lots. I've got like, uh, you know, physical, uh, you know, uh, you know, stuff like, you know. Yeah, what what I'm saying when I say a grounds but, eye view, you're I'm basing it on to, your experience, correct? correct? On this, yeah, in are, this you basing, are you basing your opinion on your experience? What you've seen, what you've experienced in your working life, yep. Not and, on and, what you've yeah, read. And on in, in research as well, and an economic understanding. Like, I've got a, for example, I mean, I was watching, say in 2008, I was watching, you know, the likes of your, your Max Kaiser, you know, and then, at, you know, Goldman Sachs, and I'd spent a lot of time reading into that, you know. So, but data, data, graphs, things like that. Have you got them from another source that isn't the Bank of England, for example? Like a source you trust. Well, I, one thing I would admit is that I, I because of my experience, I uh, see the government as as a corrupt entity. Yeah, and no, 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 that's fine. Corrupt, but let me let me get my so, get, get my thought out here. You've yeah. got two different perspectives that cannot be proved against each other because the difference is based on whether you believe that the bank of england is conspiratorial and lying and fudging the numbers etc so that you can't bridge the divide on that either you believe them or you don't but that's yeah. largely irrelevant to the point that alex is making the general point that i agree with that complaining about wages is to completely buy into the modern narrative anyway it's to buy yeah. into the idea that we should be talking about wage cucking and things like that it's just if you accept that narrative already then the people who have power who are the bourgeois class have the remit to bring in whoever makes gdp growth the fastest for example just to use one metric so whereas if we actually approach it from values and things that are higher than that and say really wage cuckery is a suboptimal condition and we need to go back to older forms of economics that's actually a better argument it's more cohesive it's more it's better for us in the long run and i i think that's the point that alex is making in a very like say macro galactic way oh, but no, I, I do agree with that but I think well, well, he's, also, he's also speaking. He's also speaking very, very technically, and very precisely, and I think a lot of us are missing that because we're not economists. Um, no, so but I think there's there's elements of what he is saying. I, I did, to be honest, I, I just, for example, it's just the idea of the, of 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 migrants. You know, a, an excess of labor. Anyone knows that an excess of labor drives down the wages. You know, everyone knows. I mean, everyone's read uh, uh, you know, and Angles, you know, and, you know, and, and no, no, everyone knows Karl Marx himself, that's himself that's obviously. It's a nonsense. It's a nonsense. It's just, yeah, that's why I'll that's, never accept no, no, that. You know, never accept no, that, that's that. No, 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 because, because the, the supply of labor is always above the demand. This is why I said that you should go and read the 2010 economic prize winning um, article but it's, it's yeah, not man, it's faster. not like it's not always above the demand i mean yeah. again that's another false statement like how's how's the supply of labor always above the demand that's just a, another <laughs> false statement man like there are seriously. always people there are always people looking for jobs again you if can you go look and at look the, in this imagine uh, you know plague ridden plague ridden europe for example no, no, there's there's there no plague, there plague, supply plague. Of labor and it wasn't above the demand you know and it, it was below there, the demand. that's there, why that's why there, that's why people you know Come on, come on. There, there's a difference between structural and frictional unemployment. There's always going to be some level of unemployment in the society. And the problem that, the, that you have from the right is that they keep focusing on the structural unemployment. There's always going to be some unemployment in society. It doesn't matter. Stop talking about wages and unemployment. It doesn't matter. You need to talk about culture. Why don't we, why don't we move away from economics a bit? Because I think this is getting a bit uh, tiresome for a lot of people. <laughs> I mean, I, could we? I, I like think we're, we're at a we're at a stalemate here. I mean, I'm not going to agree to that, man, because it just it just doesn't ring true to me. Unless, and I mean, I'm, 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 okay. I appreciate you're Alexander. I appreciate your arguments, and viewers. I'll be reading your your articles, and I'll, you know, I'm really interested to follow what you're you're working. And um, thanks very much for you know for conversing with us here. Like you know, it is very useful. I mean, because like, there's stuff I don't know. You know what I mean? Maybe I'm wrong. You know what I mean? I'm yeah, well, I mean, the thing is, what, what, what people feel on the ground is different to what's happening in the macro reality. And I think what's happening on the ground is just as important. 
just because it isn't necessarily true. We live in a post-truth economy, and because people feel it, feel that it is happening, it means it's true to them. And a lot of what's happening around Europe and populism, Brexit and Trump, is because people have felt something's not quite right and there are too many Polish and they're undercutting their wages and blah, blah, blah. And just because maybe the wages aren't being undercut doesn't mean there's not a problem. Maybe I'm getting too caught up on semantics, but we generally oh, no. agree, I think. Well, there's 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 a there's an element of truth at the bottom end of what you're talking about in, in regard with the uh, minimum wage. I mean, for example, in America, there's $15, $15 an hour. Uh, and and I mean, as a numismatist, I know that, for example, if you know, say thirty dollars, which is two hours' work, would buy you, uh, a, you know, something of great historical relevance, great value, uh, maybe even a unique piece. I mean, I've bought unique pieces and pieces that there's maybe only ten thousand minted for two for two hours' work. It's not worth it. Do you know what I mean? By the and way, so, our minimum wage isn't fifteen dollars an hour. Our national minimum wage is seven. No, no, I, I know. Well, I, no, but that's what I'm saying. It's the aspirational idea. I mean, you, I mean I'm sure you're aware of the aspirational, uh, the aspirational wage is, is fifteen dollars an hour, isn't it? You know, in the the Burger King and the you know you've heard about that. The Burger King people want to get fifteen dollars. Unfortunately, yes, I have, and it's completely friggin' stupid. So, but that's what I. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Is it? For example, for two hours standing in Burger King, maybe you know flicking switches in Burger King or throwing up burgers or whatever, uh, you're maybe getting a piece of regalia that's you know uh, you know unique and you know. But uh, I mean, again, that that's your own individual self, uh, you know. And if you can do that, then that's fine. But it just seems a bit. It does seem. I mean, that's just like a stark example of the, you know. Well, it's, it's once again, that's that's a matter of. Going back to what I was saying earlier about relative value, obviously no one like a Stahlhelm, an authentic German Stahlhelm, will run you about three hundred dollars. For me, that's three days worth of work. I mean, this is a part of big history, and yet I can work for three days and get this piece of history. It's a matter of value that not a whole lot of people want this, so they have to lower the prices to the point where they can actually move it. Well, that's it, man. But that's interesting, uh, and the difference between something like that, which I would call natural economics, versus the I, what I would call something that's maybe like the European Union there that's not natural, that's corrupt, you know. But what do you consider uh, natural? Natural is, is, is the, it's just completely uncorrupt. I mean. But that's impossible to okay. achieve. Okay. No, I, I get you. No, because again, I mean, even something like I'm talking about this natural economics. And then again, that's just, a, I mean, this is something that's words out of my mouth, but it doesn't exist. It's just a fantasy for me sitting in my bedroom, you know. I, I think I think the correct way to say it is uncoerced economics, where someone in power is not selecting winners and losers. I think I think that's what you're getting at. Well, that's that right? you see, something something like this. What you're talking about, your helmet or my coins or mm -hmm. whatever, that that isn't of of interest to the the people in the ivory towers because it's so small. It kind of escapes their their corrupt gaze, you know. But what I don't I don't it's like this rhetoric of I don't like this rhetoric of picking winners and losers. Picking or not picking, there shouldn't be winners and losers. Everything should be in its place. Well, this, is, well, this is the ideal world, mate, but you know, we're not living in that world. You know what I mean? Well, no, but do you understand what I'm saying? There are people today who misfortune befalls them because of the economic system. Correct? Correct. And that's because the economic system is geared around economics itself. It's not geared as a tool for anything. I mean, economics has become an end in and of itself. It's not, yeah, very, it's not a tool much. that's exploited by by men for the condition of men yeah. and the thus you know in, in a traditional economy there aren't winners and losers and well, ever, ever wonder why there's no unemployment data from the year 900 no you i, I guess didn't bother to include it no they, they, there was no unemployment because the economy well, again, was structured completely differently so i don't like know, a winners losers economy that's just know, completely the, anathema i don't like it either but that, this is the economy in which we live as you mentioned oh yeah 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 absolutely i'm sure absolutely but i think uh, you know Ideally, we want to get out of the paradigm of saying, "Well, we just want we want an economy where people don't pick the winners and losers." Because really, but that's this just is in why this is why this is why the macro cycles, the galactic cycles, <laughs> as people have criticized me for, are so. I've been criticized. I just because I pointed out that we're talking on different levels. I know, I know, I know. That's, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, I know. I know. You're right. We're talking on a level of right. yeah, yeah, like I, I, I do accept that. Too. A quick point that needs to be made here is again, it's 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 the geographic thing as well, which is obviously because it's something that bites me 
uh, I'm aware of it. You know, I mean, imagine somebody up in a Appalachian Martins or something that can't get down to to work somewhere. You know, their value, mm -hmm. their wage value. You know what I mean? So again, you have to th you figure things like that in. It's all barriers to entry, and so you could but say, oh, well, there's no, a guy living up there, but he's. You know I, I mean? agree. I agree with you. I, I know. I know there's a problem. I know there's a problem. I've spoken to people, and they've said to me that there's a problem. But there are two things I'd like to say. The first, I'd like to address you, and the first thing I'd like to say is, is not immigration per se. It's global trade, and what we need to get away from is this idea that we can restrict immigration and maintain global trade and protect wages and jobs. You got to get rid of both. Mm -hmm. The reason that wages are in trouble and the reason that people are feeling that they're not wealthy is that we have globalization that specializes certain industries so we are specialized in financial markets we are specialized in usury so honest people that want to go out and earn a living being a plumber or an electrician can't do it because our economy is not specialized in that way so we need to get away from demonizing migrants because they're not the problem the problem is global capitalism the second point I'd like to make about um, the macro cycles is that we need to return to a system where people are defined by their sociological position. People are defined by where they relate in society. And that's what I think is noble, noble about socialism, is at least socialists try to eradicate capitalism from society. And they say that people are more than their economic value. And what the right needs to do, just to conclude, that the right needs to get away from bashing migrants, they need to bash capitalism, and they need to create a society where people are valued for their role in society. Well, the problem with that is, is that we have, we have a very good um, propagandistic effort with the perception of lowering wages. We have a very good propagandistic effort of attacking migrants because they are the di the differing clash of cultures and the incompatibility that is a real cause of social schism um that's so a you good point for when does propaganda end and sincere sort of political thought begin well hang on because goebbels goebbels said that propaganda didn't have to be untrue propaganda yeah, exactly. could be true so I don't think oh, there yeah. is a particular delineation between propaganda and truth. Propaganda, propaganda is just truth. whatever. Propaganda to me, propaganda is truth that's like snappy. Propaganda is the social context. Is the it's social what, context? What the people? But I mean, is it is it worth mm -hmm. emphasizing? You know, anything sort of bad about the migrants because of the situation we're in, and you know, pushing the public towards a complete rejection of them for ulterior ends that we don't necessarily make apparent or plain so the difference between the fine. exoteric and the esoteric reasoning i think I that's think fine that, as well yeah. some people Why have not? raised moral qualm about that but i think it's okay to be honest keep, it, my, my keep, the, ivory towers, guys. <laughs> keep the moral quandaries in the ivory towers there are rape gangs in rotherham england yeah i mean yeah yeah, yeah my, migrants fair. are not are not you know we get we got to watch this kind of infantilization of the migrant you know they, they're coming Oh, well, it's through, not here. Through their, guys, own, guys, through their own Here, mate. Here, see that. Hold on, hold on. Here, mate. Here, mate. See that. What you just said, man. That that's ridiculous. Like, see, there's there's girls there, like, and you don't know. I mean, they could have been the, your next Alexander there, sitting maybe you know of a government grant, but they're they're being coerced into rape. I know someone who you know. I actually know uh, someone who was raped by the rape gangs. And, and 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 like I say, they're 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 ruined. I mean, they're not you know, they're not ready for university. They're not doing anything. And and again, mm -hmm. it's it's because of the EU and the again the corrupt. I mean, not that's totally seat. right. That's, that's totally on, right. You know? oh, no, no, I, I agree with you. The problem is within. I go down my city streets in Bristol, and I see on the Gloucester Road and Stagecroft three brothels, brothels, mm -hmm. where they're openly facilitating prostitution. This problem is within. The Rotherham rapists were they migrants? No, they weren't migrants. They were from within. The problem is in well, they were, our own a lot of society. them actually were. They were Pakistani migrants, but they were all. I mean, they'd maybe been in Britain twenty years or thirty years, even. You know, some of them. You know, so they weren't. They weren't new. They weren't EU migrants. You can't blame the EU. This is the Britain. The you know this but, is. But it Britain. doesn't. The point. The point. The point is, if we, cut, if we if we cut if we cut migration to zero, we had no more migrants. 
everybody here in this chat would accept we'd still have problems. And the oh, fact yeah, that we still accept that we'd have problems means that the problem is within because we live in a community of communities. Yeah. If you go to Luton or Bradford, you see in Bradford, you have the Christian community, you have the Christian community, and you have the Muslim community. They live parallel lives. You go to Luton, they have parallel lives. You go to Oxford or Bristol or London or Birmingham, they still have the same problems because the problem is within. It's from the migrant community that exists within our own society. We need to stop looking externally. It's not Syria. It's not Libya. It's not Iraq or Afghanistan. It's the people within our own society. And we need to stop focusing on externalities and focus on the problem within. Well, the problem from within is that we let people from these other societies into our countries. It is as simple so as that, man. Tell them. But, but hang on, hang on, because the people that come, the people that come, the people that come are generally all right. The people that have the incentive to come to the UK generally have some kind of affinity to UK values. What we find is that second and third generations detract from British values. They don't feel that they have a place because oh, so they are exiled. Yeah. Oh, no, are Alex exiled. Alexander, I mean, I see when you said you, you're from Bristol. That actually just helped me out with understanding your sort of position. I mean, Bristol is again. I mean, it's like Bath. It's another place. I mean, I've been, I've been to Oxford, Bath, Bristol, all the rest of it, uh, and and you can get this kind of a very kind of uh, an academic eye view of these migrants, and you think of people because I went to college in England, for example, uh, and I've, I, I mean, I've had really great relationships with these Muslim people, Indians giving me, you know, for example, helping me out with textbooks and all the rest of it. And, and so you get like a, you, you meet a certain, uh, a certain grade of immigrant and you think, oh, all these guys are, these are all fucking brilliant people, you know, but obviously again, at the lower levels, you see, I mean, there's people, you know, who are just brought in. Imagine you're living in a flat somewhere. And there's just this lunatic from from Ghana who's who's like a child soldier above you. Yeah, the point, the, the point, the point I'm trying to make is that true, man. You know, it's real. Like, you know, it's no, not no, a joke. The, the, the real, the, the problem is, is not the first wave of immigrants. The problem is the second and third generations. The what about the child, the child soldier, the child soldier, rapey? You know, the guy that's got look, the razor look, blade. Okay. Look, the, seven, like, the, seven, the seven, the seven, the seven, the seven attacks. Okay, the seven, seven attacks were perpetrated by people that were born here. All of the Rotherham rape gangs were people that were born here. The problem is not immigrants per se. No, it's the integration. Well, what you're, what you're well, doing, Alex, you're going very, through. very, very precisely. He's speaking, he means exactly what he says when he says it. He's not generalizing. I think that's the problem is that you're speaking, once again, Alex, you're speaking on a, you're speaking on a, not to say pedantic, but you're speaking more precisely than we are. And I think yeah, it's like an academic view away. instead of, I mean, but it's like the the English Defense League. I mean, I went around with, with you know, with the English Defense League for a few years um, and I've been to, I mean, because I've experienced, I've seen, I've seen rape gangs in action. I've known people who have been raped by the rape gangs. And again, it is a working class problem because they don't target they don't target uh, middle class people. Well, they do target some, but very rarely middle class people. Well, but it's because they can't get there. That's the biggest thing. Yeah, that's it. They do because I mean, it's just like anything else, and it's the same. It's the same in Northern Ireland now. They're bringing them in, and and they're. Um, you know, our government now are saying, well, you're a racist and you're a paramilitary and you're, oh, you're, you know, you've got this history of terrorism, so we'll bring these Pakistanis. And then the Pakistanis, if they go, you know, if you were to go to the police and say they've raped my daughter, you're the man standing there that's a terrorist, you know, and the Pakistanis like God, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's what you're dealing with, you know, and that's just at the, the, the low levels, you know. I'm not, I'm not saying that's anything to do with me, but that's just way, the way people see it on the street, and that's the truth, the truth of the matter. But academically, I mean, I mean, Alexander, I was talking about uh, seven seven, but I mean, it's like the rape gangs. It's like not even the rape gangs, but and and for example, London. You know, there's there's been like a gazillion, literally a gazillion rapes of white women by blacks in London, and there's these white girls getting raped in the gangs in London. Like, if you're a white girl and you grew up in in one of these like ghetto places, you have to be raped into one of the gangs. But you know, gang raped into the gangs, and there's actually an, uh, like a documentary about that. And again, that's another thing that people. I mean, it's not on Alexander's list of you know quantifiable flipping, 
you know, quantifiable logic list, no, you know? It's not, it's but, not, not flippant. It's just not flippant because you need to, uh, you, if you're going to um, treat an illness of a body, you need to be able to diagnose the problem. And if you say that your right arm has gangrene and the doctor cuts off the left arm, but well, he hasn't done anything to solve your gangrene problem. So what you need to do is to uh, understand what the problem really is. And the problem is not the first wave of migrants that come. The problem are the migrants that are brought up in the UK. The well, the second generation and third generation. Well, the, well, problem, that's not, the problem with that's that just... idea is that the first round of migrants have the second and third round of migrants. You have to cut it off at the source. No, but here, right stuff, guy, man. You, you, you're agreeing with this guy. And again, it's, I would even, man, Alexander, I'm not joking you, man. I don't know where the hell you, I mean, like you say, you come from Bristol because I know, I know Bristol, it's like a left, lefty place. Like, so I get, I get, I get where you're coming from and I get the idea of the quantification and you, you think that everything's all, all legitimate and that the police have legitimate records and that there's no corruption and there's no users and the Bank of England and all is wonderful and all the rest of it. And that's fair enough. But it's not the case. I'll tell you that now. It's not well, no, no, but St. Same, same Paul's for example. in Bristol. For, I'll give you a case study. Uh, St. Paul's was a white area until the 1950s. And in the wind rush, a lot of Afro-Caribbeans came in to St. Paul's in the 1950s. And then from the 60s to the 90s, it became a no-go zone for the police. Okay, The police weren't going into that area because of gangs. And now it's been cleared up. I mean, But the problem is, in the 1990s, it wasn't the first generation immigrants that were creating the problem. It was the third generation and the second generation immigrants. I mean, if you take somebody that was from France and they moved to the UK and then their children grew up in a middle class background, it wouldn't be a problem at all. The problem is the second and third generation immigrants. And this is something that we need to get around our heads is that it doesn't matter whether or not you came here or not. If you're here and you're a second or third generation, you're still a threat. But once again, we have to think about, you're saying the first generation isn't a problem. They are because they lead to the problem. They're the primogenitor is the problem. They themselves no, end up bringing the issue. But again, it's another false statement. I mean, we're on here, this guy's telling us he's false. I mean, there's there's people who are the first generation, they're, they're raping, raping people constantly. Uh, you know, there's just blacks coming over, at the, you know, the day after they arrive, they, they stab somebody up or they're raping somebody in McDonald's. And, and then you're just giving this, this false false statement and then we're supposed to accept that like and then your man's saying okay. oh yeah yeah Bo bollocks mate you know it's just not true it's just not the case well, hold on I, don't understand. I don't know why you would do that why you would even say something i mean you're, you're uh, okay. so specific on certain things and then but this here is just a general statement of oh well they're the first generation's fine and yeah you know, yeah what... hold on a second irish <laughs> alexander you're saying that the first generation are you just saying that in general they do less they cause fewer problems Look, the, why, the, f the first generation of people, generally speaking, come to the UK or the USA or France because their values are the same or similar to the values of the country they're going to. If um, a migrant went to the US, they would generally believe in roughly American principles. The problem is with the second and third generation because the second and third generation are in a state of modern exile. They don't feel as though they're connected to the society they're born in, right. and they don't feel connected to the society that the heritage comes from. So a Pakistani second-generation immigrant in the United Kingdom doesn't necessarily feel connected to the UK, and he doesn't necessarily feel connected to Pakistan, which is where the problems arise. Well, once, right. once again, you have to, and that's that was true in years past. Right now, we're just we're we're taking the worst of the worst. Right now, uh, that's a big part of the problem. So what Northern is saying is absolutely true because we're just anyone, you know, it, you, you, the UK is a party. Everyone come on in. The United States is a party. Everyone come on in. It's not the people whose values we align with, people who can contribute economically. It's just everyone's coming in. And that's a big part of the, like, this isn't voluntary. People are just being flooded in. Also, like I said before, the first generation gives rise to the second generation. So how do we solve the problem of disenfranchisement among the second and third generations of Middle Eastern, Black, etc., migrants to Western countries? Once they it's have easy. Kids, there, there is a there is a there is a solution, and it's the solution that we've had for hundreds of years until the past sort of 20, 30 years, maybe even seventy years, is numbers. And we've always in the United Kingdom had a very, very low level 
of migration, sort of a 2% to 5%, mm -hmm. extremely low level. I mean, Punch and Judy is something that we take as being quintessentially British, but it was brought over by Italian merchants who originated in Turkey. We've mm -hmm. had very, very low levels of migration for a long time. The problem is integration. And Pat Buchanan in America, that you're probably aware of, mm -hmm. and other sort of paleoconservatives have understood this to be the problem, that when Blair came in in 1997, he opened up the doors to hundreds of thousands, millions of people to come in in the space of a decade. And that yeah. totally ruined the slow and imperceptible integ integration that we had for the past thousand years. Mm -hmm. but, and that's uh, very well said. So we have the solution, obviously, is then to cut them off and send exactly. them back. Yeah. We gotta go but, then we'd still, but, then, but then if we cut them off, we cut them off. Okay, this is a solution that's actually quite valid. You cut immigration totally, but then you would still have to deal with the second and third generation problems. And most of the problems come from the second and third generation. Not so necessarily. For 40, most of them do. Well, yeah, but uh, well, I'm, I'm, coming from, I'm coming at it from a perspective of ethnic nationalism. Um, if we... Right, okay. Well, that's, that, they got to go back. You got to go back. One okay. second, guys. One yeah. second. I, I actually, I think well, there's, a, there's a point we're missing here, and that it's the communist influence. You know, I think a lot of the second generation, third generation people are, are being very highly influenced by these communists, and that they're, they're ma being made to feel. I mean, for example, like myself, I know that I'm probably uh, erroneously, you know, uh, I feel I've been put down by the EU or something, maybe more than I actually am. There's an element of you know uh, corruption or whatever, but probably I believe that it's more than what it is. Um, but I would say that the communists are putting these these people who are third, second generation. They've gone through these. Uh, for example, a lot of them, their parents were in the 1970s. Were uh, you know your Merkel, your 68ers, you know your Merkel, your Angela Merkel 68ers in Germany, for example, and they were going through the uh, the school then, and then that was that their kids are the you know their kids are the guys that are joining ISIS now, you know for example they're they're fully trained doctors but they're joining ISIS, you know and and they're the kids of these people that went through the Angela Merkel 68ers, you know Hubert Marcuse uh, schools, you know. Yeah, I think that's valid. There's definitely a level of uh, anti-white indoctrination going on in schools. It's not. It's not even well, not anti-white. It's it's, it's it's just uh, you know just you know revolutionary ideas. You know. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I agree with you 100. percent Well, I mean, I think that's going to stem naturally. It's it's easy to get people who feel like outsiders to buy into things like that because, I mean, They're like outsiders. Yeah, I mean, it's just because like people are naturally going to if you go to a place where you don't feel any real roots there. If, if you don't sense that this uh, society you live in is a product of your people and its and its historical values, then you're going to feel alienated even if you like a lot of the ideas because you're going to know on some level that you're different and that you're not of this civilization. Yeah. So, I mean, Absolutely. it's easy to get people like that to start trying to change it. I mean, it's just kind of a natural thing that people are going to – people are going to want to change this, uh, their environment to I, accommodate them more. It. I mean, it's like the end feeds. I mean, if you look at uh, it's all end feeds. If you look at, like, for example, Pakistanis um, in in the UK, there's so many end feeds. Some of it's economic. Might be the, I mean, they actually a lot. A lot of them voted for Brexit because they know that the Polish are taking their their jobs. And in these inner city areas, even where the grooming gangs and that operate, like the grooming gangs are maybe maybe control a certain town but then there's these maybe these albanians are coming in and selling drugs where the grooming gangs used to sell the drugs and stuff you know um so it's stuff like that like there's just all these different end feeds and and, and things like that and and it's very significant you know because you do whenever you've got for example if you've got a grooming gang uh the med police said that they can make 300 grand off a girl in uh in a year and that uh, and and it's so significant because a person like myself is maybe making ten thousand pound, twelve, fifteen thousand pounds a year, but well, these guys right. are just uh, yeah. one girl's making I mean, three hundred. So the influence is so high, yeah. you know. It, and then it, the it drugs, is, you put the, the drugs on top of that, you know. You put you put you put the drugs in. You put the trafficking in. It's absolutely despicable. And there's one very very good solution to this: is that you hang them from the neck until they're dead. Yep. It's very very simple.
Yeah, well, that's none a, of this. Uh, none of this fucking about. You just hang them. That's very, very simple. They've committed a disgusting crime, and they should be punished for it. They ruined people's lives completely at a young age. I know it's a nice, it's nice to say that, but the the reality is it's not happening. They're they're getting away with it, like you know, or or if they're not, they're up there in jail. But I, I mean, one percent of them or something's ever convicted. It's you know, they're still most of them out there, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the establishment, isn't it? It is it's the liberal establishment. And you were talking a lot about the EU and the establishment of Westminster. And you're totally right. I mean, the establishment is setting its um, sights against us, against yeah. people like you and I, that are patriotic British people that believe in hanging, that believe in justice, that believe in honour and believe in nation. We're the people that are being attacked. And we're the people that need to fight back. You fucking cis-hat white scum. How dare you? How dare oh you with your country? What's that making your country anyway? <laughs> <laughs> it's just an economic landscape. It's just a, as Alexander says, it's just a, it's like a, a terror, an economic terror. No, no, but the, but the, but the point, the point, no, no, the point is that the fact that the second and third generations are alienated is because it's not an economic landscape. It's because in order to be British, you have to be rooted in something that's prior. You have to be rooted in race. You have to be rooted in culture. And these people that are born black or Muslim in England can never be English. They can never be British. And then their alienation turns themselves towards Islamic terror because they don't have anything to identify with because they're not, they're not British and they never will be British. I'm gonna, well, I mean, I actually, I would say that there's, I think British, for example, I think a bit more loose than English. But I think there's black people that I've met that you could probably say were British, you know. I mean, they've grown up mm -hmm. on in Britain, and and to be honest, they, they adhere to most of the values, and they're not. But then, uh, they're, they're they go play along with our rules, and they're nice don't people. Don't you think it's harder? Don't you're you think it's harder be... because you get someone like Nigel Farage, and Nigel Farage comes out of a French Huguenot background, but he's still British. And don't you think that being white is implicit to being British? There's some kind of identity to Britishness that means you have to really be white in order to be British. No, what yeah. do you mean? I mean, I'm, I'm not British, for example. I'm, I'm sitting here with you, and I'm not British. Well, you're Irish, You're Ulsterman, right? aren't you? No, no, you're an Ulsterman. Yeah, yeah but, that, but Ulster man... Although they say we we love our Britishness, we're not British because we're not born in that that particular island of Britain. I mean, we we are on Ireland, you know. So it's I mean it's a, it's again it's another another uh, you know there's another layer of you know uh, debate to it. I mean they believe that, well I that you know as again it's just a debate like I, I, if you're born you're on really Ireland, right. you know. Yeah, I mean, you're right. We have enough multiculturalism as it is. We have English identity, Welsh and Scottish and Ulsterman. We have enough multiculturalism as it is. Britain is a civic identity. And we have enough multiculturalism. We don't need blacks and Muslims in our society at all, do we? I mean, you can have a certain level. I mean, you, you, I mean we're, not, we're not looking for fucking total, total annihilation here. You can have a certain amount. I mean, black, for example, you know, you could have a certain level amount, and it would probably be be healthy, uh, just because you need interaction, and especially in this global age, you need a, a certain amount of interaction. I mean, you don't, you know, cut everybody off mm -hmm. and, and be some freaks that are like these, like Ukraine. I mean, Ukraine, for example, is like a, an ethno state, but it's hardly a utopia, you know. So there's there's an well, element the thing. of that. We, we, yeah. No, I agree with you. I think you're right. There's you always been a very, very low level about it. You know what I mean? We're not looking for, you know, something mad. We're just like, we just want a bit of a respite from this just onslaught. You know, it's we're not looking for, mm -hmm. you know, an uh, a you know, Hitler's, Hitler's great ideas or anything. We're looking just for a bit <laughs> of a, a, a relaxation of the the attacks. And the grooming and all. You well, know, that's right. It's very simple. That's right. You know? and I, yeah, I know it is. It is simple. And I do agree with you that we've always had a very, very low level of migration. And don't you think it's funny that Ireland is wanting to be independent from England, but in the next fifty years, it won't even be Irish? Well, you see, this is the thing. This is the thing. It's something that we've. It's actually a bit of a project that we've been doing is trying to improve the relationship between people from Northern Ireland with people from the south of Ireland, of our own mindset, you know. 
And it's been mm -hmm. something that's been very difficult because obviously as soon as you, if you do that and somebody hears about that, then they'll say, well, you're a traitor, you know, you're you're speaking to that person and you're you're basically, you might as well be like Guy Fox, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, so you're you're an Ulsterman, are you, are, you a, are you Protestant? Yeah, I mean, I'm a, you know, true blue loyalist, mm -hmm. like, you know, in, in you theory, think, like. Do you yeah. think that Protestants, Protestants and Catholics need to overcome their differences in favour of ethnic survival? Yeah, I mean, I mean, da there's, I mean, there's a definitely they do, but again, not, not. It doesn't need to be Hitler's twenty, uh, Hitler twenty twenty seven. You know, like no blacks or anything. You know, just some sensible. You know, do you know what I mean? Just well, some quite sensible. frankly, restricting either citizenship or the ethnic makeup of your country to only your ethnic, uh, your co ethnics is the sensible option. Like the blacks in England are a lot better than the blacks in the United States. The blacks in England are still bad. I could tell you some stories and give you some statistics, and you'd be like, "They got to go back to Africa on the next boat, like right the fuck now." But the point, the point, the point that I'm trying to make that a lot of people have misunderstood, perhaps I haven't articulated myself very well, is that I mean, the Africans in America—they're not first-generation Africans. The Africans that have been there for centuries. No, but again, that's have, another. That's another. A lot of them actually are back. Obama blue ends, man. Back Obama mm -hmm. blue ends from my last fucking. They've been bringing them in like mad for the last thirty years. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, even 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 the blacks that are in America now are still problematic in their society. And the Muslims that we have, even if they're third, second, fourth generation, they're still a problem. Yep. Yep. And it's well, the pro having dated a an Arab girl, I could tell you why. It makes sense for them to keep their women in beekeeper suits. Arabs tend to have a very, very, very big problem controlling their passions. That's and their culture is ordered around controlling Arab passions. White people tend to have a very easy time controlling their passions. Our society is not ordered around controlling our passions because we do it ourselves. Blacks can't control their passions by and large, which is why places like Kenya, you steal like an apple, you get your hand cut off. It's a very steep mm -hmm. punishment, so it actually gets through their skulls that you don't do these kind of things. When you bring someone who can't control their passions into a society where you don't have to control your passions, or external society doesn't have to control your passions, you get these outgrowths, mm -hmm. like the rape gangs, like high crime, like welfare fraud, mm -hmm. like abuse, like street violence, like gang violence. That's the problem. Exactly. That's culture. totally that, that is that is that's totally right. And the problem, the, the 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 point I'm trying to make, is that with multiculturalism, you end up with communities within a community. You end up with a Muslim community and a black community and a white community. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter how many generations you have of a Muslim community; they're never going to integrate. Well, they'll integrate once it becomes uh, uh, England. It's in, yeah, Englandistan. The yeah, the Caliphate of London. Didn't the, uh... But that's the thing. Oh, I was it won't be English. Oh. Go on, Ian. Oh, I was just saying, uh, like, I know that, uh, didn't the, uh, I think it was, is Czechia, the prime minister said, we will never have a Muslim community in this country. And he recognizes, like, once that thing becomes an actual community, then it, it becomes sort of something that exercises power. The same way it's absurd that in the U.S. we have the "Quote unquote undocumented community, like it's just, a, a, it's like a sector of, pe of the population that has a distinct identity and that wants to exercise political power." I mean, but yeah, all of very, these, very, all of the, all of these communities exert power through victimhood. They exert strength through victimhood. They say we are a minority and therefore we should have certain rights that are exclusive to ourselves. And one of the things about the white nationalist circuit that I don't particularly like is this whole thing about save the white race and that the white race is somehow a victim because we can't win that game. We can't win it. We can't say that we're the victims because we'll never be more of a victim than a black Muslim homosexual. Well, now, hold on. No, Alexander, I, I agree with that. No, I, I, I disagree with that. Here's the I, thing. I disagree as well. That's, that's ridiculous. That's another well, hold ridiculous. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let Miles speak first. The white victim narrative, because modern Western morality is aligned upon the underdog being morally correct, regardless of circumstance, 
if you align whites as the underdog, you attract more whites to the cause. It's not necessarily true, but it helps for propagandistic efforts. Also, the thing to keep in mind is that the ruling class of uh, Western society is largely, I don't want to necessarily say Jewish because I think it goes deeper than Judaism. I think it's a personality flaw. Um, pathologically altruistic people who are addicted to virtue signaling essentially own the society, and that just happens to be very common among Jews. Um, neuroticism. It's a neuroticism, and it's just it's common among these types of people. I know, I know, but getting just, getting back to get, get, getting back to the point that if we assert that we're the victim, we've already conceded cultural supremacy, and we have accepted that we are ourselves a minority, and that's a very very dangerous position because we are trying to assert strength through victimhood. And we can't do it. We have to say we are the dominant power. We are the cultural power, and we have to assert strength through strength, not strength through victimhood. And as a, a, aligning with truth, you're absolutely correct. But aligning for propagandistic efforts, uh, I think uh, aligning or positing whites as being not necessarily the victims, but being under threat from waves of multiculturalism, from from traitorous whites, uh, from Jewish power structures. I think that has a lot of value. I would agree. But I mean, like, become, but then... if you're saying you're a victim, it's like you're kind of begging for someone else's mercy. That that's something you know. We there's somebody to beg from. They're yeah. not going to give it to us either way. So, so it's not necessarily victimhood. It's it's recognizing the fact that whites are under threat. Right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, for example, that, that, I mean, that, if you that, look at you look at Irish Irish people, uh, a, a big part of the Irish psyche is that, uh, and and if you look at it, any of these Irish uh, uh, journalists, they're always constantly going, "Oh, the Irish people were." took over in slave boats to Jamaica, indentured servitude, and we were put in with it. That's why they love all this liberal stuff, you know, like the Southern or the Catholics, basically, you know, but the Southern people in particular. Oh, I was took over in a slave. Well, my, you know, and there's there's an element of truth in that because there was, I mean, but, exact, but it's the same thing, like, uh, in Southampton, they used to, you know, the people, they used to come over and grab English people and put them, like, press gang them on the Royal Navy ships during the Crimean War and all, you know, and even during whenever they were fighting the French. Well, we've, we've stepped over that. The problem with that game is that you end up with um, a tally, a tally of who has committed the crimes against whom. And we shouldn't be ashamed of the crimes that we've committed against other races. We shouldn't be ashamed of colonialism. We shouldn't be ashamed of slavery. And the problem with playing these victim games is we end up saying that, oh, what about ism? We say, oh, well, what about the white slaves? You know, what about the oppression against whites? We have to step over that and affirm ourselves in a positive way. I agree yeah. with you completely. I, I, I still think there's rhetorical value in the whatism because it's a good thing to throw in the face of uh, to throw not you're not going to convince true believers. You're not going to convince these neurotic cat ladies. You will convince onlookers when they say, "Yeah, what about white slaves? This whole diversity thing. It's bull, this whole black victim narrative. It's bull crap." I think that's them, but then the why do they? But well, where do they go from that? They say that we're a victim, and then they go from that. They say that we should be equal, that whites are oppressed, and whites should be somehow equal to blacks. But that's not what we want. We want an affirmation of white supremacy over other cultures because we are a white British society. No, I don't. I don't believe. That. I don't believe. I don't believe in white supremacy. Um, for example, on the basketball field. You know, there's I, not don't think that's what I don't think anybody believes in white supremacy. I mean, and the idea of the affirmation of white supremacy against another. I, another I, I, was saying about, I think, you're, mis I, I think I, you're misunderstanding him, Irish. I think what he's saying is like that he wants, you know, white people to have dominion over the civilizations that they founded. Is, is that more what you're saying? I would just be careful, man, because I mean, because this guy's from Bristol. I'm not. I'm not slabbering at you, Alexander, but it's just paranoia on my part is that. There's people, especially from people from universities, who could come, come on to like a, maybe a chat like this, and then use this as part of their coursework. Do you know? And you know that that is that sort of thing you're going to be seeing in the future. So I'm not slabbering at you, Alexander. Not, but I'm just being paranoid here, like you know. No, I, under, I understand. The no, way I, 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 you're I using the I things like the affirmation, the affirmation. I'm a white supremacist. White supremacy and all that sounds a bit. It all just. <laughs> 
It hits me up the wrong way. I'm not a white supremacist in the American sense. What I'm trying to say is that we can't play the victim narrative. We can't do it because that's what everybody else does. We have to overcome that. But, uh, I think we have to. I mean, I, I say I'm, yeah, I, I'm white supremacist. I believe that whites are supreme at being white. And yep. that other people will always fall short of being white and that putting a lot of money and effort into trying to make people who are not white be equal to whites is a waste of time. No, that's and good. That's and resources and lives. Yeah, yeah, and lives. The term itself you have to be careful about just because it carries a certain connotation. I think we got to stop caring about mean. this. I've just been debating with somebody a little bit on, on, a, on that uh, YouTube uh, Dear White People video. Oh, um, God. I, I realized in the middle of this conversation, I started doing exactly what Alexander was saying. I started doing some things of talking about slavery and and trying to mitigate slavery in some way. I mean, I was just trying to show some facts against the kind of moronic standard narrative. And in the end, my last comment was just simply, you know, white is an evolving reality. It's something we have both that we, has both been chosen for us and that we choose. And we just simply choose to move forward with it. We do, I don't care about your Marxist narrative. I identify as white. If, I, if that was invented last week, I don't care. Yep. This is a reality that we are coalescing from history and from current reality, and we are moving forward with it. Um, sorry, you're not, if you're white, you know, join us if you want. Otherwise, like, it's irrelevant. I don't care about your Marxist history. I don't care about your victim. That's right. Class. That's yeah, right. Because 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 we Marxist history are, assume, Marxist we are Marxist who we history are. assumes that everybody is prior. My Marxist history assumes that everybody is tabula, tabula rasa, but we all come from something that is before us, mm -hmm. and that we should step over these stupid victim games that even the BMP started to dole out, which are quite pathetic about how well. What about the white slaves and what about the Holodomor? But we can't play those games we can't win those games I mean just stop thinking about political expediency they do have some I mean I think they have some effect in in bringing people over but ultimately yeah the, the position of strength is one of just simply being strong not not trying to win the victim game yeah I mean, so, something I've, I've actually been to sort of thinking about recently was there's a certain that this is a bit heavy going here like but it looks like that the uh, the powers that be are trying to raise up a, a certain spectre from Northern Ireland's history and use it as a new uh, a new kind of figure in the in the racist you know the the racist uh, plane you know and something I would say against that was it's unfair to people from Northern Ireland you know to do that like you know uh, because people again what you're doing is you're classifying people as being, you know, again, bringing up the terrorist pass, all this sort of stuff, you know. Like, it's, it's just mad, you know, doing that, like. And then this victim, victimhood thing again, you know. It's 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 a form of communism, like, you know, but, but again, no, it's working right. with, it's no, no, EU, exactly. not, like, you know, because they're yeah, that desperate. I think, yeah, I think what you said is totally right. It is communism, because that's what every single other communist vanguard does. They say, we are the blacks, and you're going to give us strength through victimhood or else. We are the Muslims. You're going to give us strength through victimhood or else. And we can't play the game of we are white and therefore you should give us strength yeah. through victimhood or else because yeah. we're not part of that communist game. We're not part of that EU game or that Westminster game. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, I, I mean, guys in Northern Ireland, something I've realized, even myself, I mean, I, I mean, I would consider myself intelligent and stuff, but like I say, I, I mean, I'm sitting here talking to guys that, to be honest, a lot of you guys are probably more smart than me, you know what I mean? And I'm struggling here to keep up, but I, I feel like compelled that I have to try and keep up with this, you know, because, I, you know, it's that important, you know? Do you know what I mean? Like, I really do. I mean, I'm trying, trying to the keep feel, it The like feeling that. that you have, yeah, but the feeling that you have is real. It's real to you, you know? There's all this stuff that's going on. Is happening to you and it's happening to me and it's happening to everybody in this hangout and yeah. you know there are some things that supersede statistical or economic truth there are things that we know culturally and implicitly that are happening and that are bad that we should overcome yeah absolutely 
So, I mean, what about the right stuff, man? How's that going? Like, how have you got over, have you got over all that carry on about your man's wife or whatever? Oh, man, that has been, that was a new to Shella. That was an utter Shella. Um, the position you, you lost. You represent that? the entire right stuff? No, no, no. I no. wasn't here. I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, 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 no. I no one really represents the right stuff. The uh, the right stuff is Mike Enoch's project. He represents the right stuff. Everyone else is just mouthing off. Um, so you're on the forum over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the I'm, only reason I have this email is because I just uh, I'm like, you know what? What if we want a YouTube channel one day? So I just I grab that domain real quick, and I'm just, I'm trying to do my part to help our radio network. Uh, do, do you mind? Do you, do you, do you mind saying who you are in the forum or on on the on the discuss comments? Oh sure, uh, I'm M Poland. Uh, oh. You'll typically find me. I'm a chess piece with a MAGA hat. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yep. So here, did you, you say you're Pol Polish or something? Are you? No, no. Uh, Poland is just the last name of my mon uh, my nom de guerre. It's uh, Miles Poland. But is it you're from Poland? Are you Polish? Are you or what? Well, ethnically, yeah. But no, it's it's oh, just. Oh man, here, man, you take my jobs, mate. You take my job, mate. <laughs> <laughs> What are you doing, mate? You come out, come here, come here, come here, come here, mate. What are you saying? You're, I'm going to uncle Irishman. Hey, lad, you took me some lads. What are you doing, mate? Fuck you, fucking Irishman. I'm going to uncle Irishman and then build you a fucking shit. I'm going to build you a fucking shit. Get fucked. Fucking, you took my fucking job, you fucking idiot, mate. What are you doing, like? Get out of my fucking car. Hey, you know what? If you were going to uncle Irishman, you would have me. Are you on about, like, I can start to wrap you up? No, I'm only joking, man. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Oh man, yeah, that I'm, uh, I'm hall monitor in disgust, and I'm I don't I can't remember what I am inside the forum. Anyway. Nice, definitely. I'll keep an eye out for you. Yeah, um, yeah. probably yeah, William yeah. Scott in the forum. Okay, yeah, oh, you're on the around. forums, William. I got in. Cool. Extreme vetting. Yeah, I, nice. I, I. Oh, maybe I'm maybe I'm folkways inside the forum. Ah, shoot, I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, we got most yeah. regularly are uh, still get banned, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a big thing. We had a number of we had a series of leaks that led to the uh, the docs. But yeah, the whole uh, Mike Enoch thing, uh, that was a whole nut of show. Um, we lost probably about a quarter of our listener base, um, which is a good chance to rebuild. But we lost a good chunk of our podcasts, uh, not because of leaving, but because of doxing threats. Um, so yeah, right now, we're, about that. yeah, we're we're in the process of rebuilding right now. And uh, oh, what's yeah, it was certainly uh, at a. How, how I was going to say, uh, Miles, how long have you been part of TRS? Oh, geez, I've been on the floor for like a year now. So, are you like, do you have like official standing within their system, or do you are you just a fan who who's in the forums or what? Uh, vaguely, I'm a content producer. I've been on a couple of the podcasts. I'm like the uh, David Spade of uh, the TRS podcast network. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of the content buzzard. I'm like, oh, what's that? A, a show? Can I be on it, guys? Cool. Wait, wait, which ones have you been on? Uh, geez, I've been I've produced a little bit of content for the Fatherland. Uh, I've been on Bongo Bongo Book Club. Uh, oh. Obviously, the Godcast. That's one I'm a co-host on. I think I've been on like one or two others. I think. I've, I, I always wanted to listen to Bongo Bongo Book Club, but I never got around to it. And now I think they're gone, aren't they? No, no, they're still do uh, they're still doing their thing. Uh, whether it's not it's still on the radio site, I have no idea. I know their SoundCloud is still up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> It's, rid it's, it's ridiculous. It's good fun. It's like where they read books written by black people and they just kind of make fun of them. Oh, no, no. It's not just black people. It's urban fiction. Okay. And every <laughs> every black stereotype you've ever heard is affirmed and exemplified in these books. It is delightful. I'm reading yeah. this. I'm like, wow. This isn't like... It reads like a white supremacist. Someone like me writing a book that I think would sell to black people. I'm like, hmm, let's see, what, what, what should this dumbass do next? Oh, I know, he'll grab his dick. Oh, that's funny. And then he's going to talk about shooting his nine. And then I look over the book that's already been written, and it's a 12-part series by Denisha Diamond. And I'm like, hmm, wow, I missed Diamond. the book on this one. Yeah, Diamond. Yeah, I do wonder how many of these people who produce these stereotypical things are actually Jews. I mean, <laughs> just ghostwriting. I mean, like, well, yeah, I mean, look I at like, right, man, I, I mean, a lot of this black exploitation stuff. I mean, this is probably written by Jews. I mean, oh, yeah, that's that that's Jewy as all get out. There's I, there's no <laughs> doubt. There's somewhere along the line. There's someone there's someone clutching the hand somewhere along that line from uh, from concept to consumer. Yeah. 
Well, we all know who runs Hollywood, so. Yeah. That's they don't ever give Hollywood. In. They admit they run Hollywood. The Irish. Marlon Brando. Exactly. So. <laughs> Mel Gibson. <laughs> they know. They all know. Yes, the Catholics. I'm saying that my my granddad met Marlon Brando in Hong Kong, like, and he said he was alright. Well, you know. Who who met him? Well, my granddad lived in Hong Kong at a certain time. You know what I mean? He said he met Marlon Brando in Hong Kong. Hmm. I think it was maybe the sixties or something, fifties or something. Okay. Not sure when. Or... What are Marlon What's Brando doing there? Oh, okay, who knows? You know. I don't think we want to speculate. That might ruin the <laughs> reputation of Marlon Brando if we speculate too uh, too closely. Yeah, that's Marlon true. That's <laughs> kind of uncouth. Yeah. Yeah. Cheers, boy. Cheers. Also, I'm not sure whether or not. Well, I think. Um, Good. Just saying, I think I'm going to head off because um, I've got to be up at sort of nine in the morning. So. Yeah, it's pretty late there, isn't it? So I'll get a few. Hours. I only I only sleep about four hours a night, but, uh, like base Trump. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for coming, um, on, Alexander. All right, have a good night, man. Yeah, it was, uh, uh, thanks very much, man. I enjoyed. I know, I know I've been I've been argumentative here, like, but I have enjoyed your your chat. Man. God bless you. God bless <laughs> you. Man, I, I'll I, pray I, for you tonight. Yeah, man, I'll pray for you tonight, boy. Likewise, likewise. It's been an interesting chat. Uh, I think you guys are all decent people. So I'll um I head off and uh, have a good night. Have a good, good night, sir. Thanks night. for being here. There's just four of us. Yeah, was Alexander on the? Was he on the plebeian podcast tonight too? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I, I believe he was. Um, but I know that uh, that's where Mark was before he did this one. So, so I think a lot of I think a lot of our viewers actually were at the plebeian podcast before this. Oh, that's why we had a, such a high viewer content. Or, well, we had a lot last time too. I think we got over twenty last time. Of course. Oh, cool. Of course, the plebeian podcast gets like seventy or eighty people at a time. So nice. For a bunch of pikers. <laughs> it's, it's interesting, you know, it's, it, it's thought provoking, like, you know, it is. Yeah. Hey, uh, Irish. Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, you more to say. I was going to say, um, do they uh, do they show the Super Bowl in Northern Ireland? Um, yeah. Uh, well, you see, in Northern, in Northern Ireland, you know, um, um, that you can watch anything. You can watch anything, but you can watch anywhere else, like, you know. Uh, there's Sky Sports and all, just like anywhere else, like, you know. You can watch anything, man. You can watch whatever you want. If you can pay for it, like, if you got money. You know. So you, so you, so you have to pay to see it? I would think I would think so. Like you know, I've never bothered. I, mean, I don't really like American football to be honest, because because it, yeah. it stops and starts. You know, it's very. Bo I would find it boring. Like to be honest, because yeah. it stops and then they start again and all that. I like more free flowing. Like I like rugby, or I used to play rugby for years uh, until um, I, unfortunately I got not into it or whatever. But uh, but I used to play rugby. I don't like uh, this stopping and starting thing. It's just yeah. the stop start nature of it. Like it's no good. In my opinion, yeah. you know. Well, I, I guess the reason I was asking is because in America, the Super Bowl is like this big hyped event, and you hear about how it's being watched all over the world. And I'm thinking, well, why do they care about this in other countries? That's my own thought. So, no, like, no. Oh, well, they, you see, there's, I think there's, uh, there's, there's a bit, of, a good bit of interest that uh, people who do watch it, people who watch it all the time. I mean, whenever I was working night shift, I used to, uh, on a Friday night or something, I would come home and watch ESPN and watch, you know, these highlights of these football games or whatever, just because of the time of the night that I was working and I would have like I would, you know, come back and have a beer or two and watch these ESPN reruns of all these, you know, football games or whatever. Um, but there's games at Wembley, as you know. You know, there's I think so many games a year played at Wembley there. So for the English that's something to and then there's a lot of I mean, I know I, I've got American friends who live in England. I used to go to Cov you know, Coventry City matches. Uh, matches, hmm. you know, matches in, in Birmingham and stuff with people from America. So, uh, again, people are interested in football. It's just the same. It's like anything, you know what I mean? It's like anything. Hmm. I, I heard that in the 80s they used to broadcast NFL games in the UK, and so there are some NFL teams that were 
like the teams that were really good in the 80s tend to have strong fan bases in the UK today. Yeah, I mean, what I would say is that it, 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 it's very particular. Um, there's a there's there's an NFL league in Northern Ireland, for example. Um, but there's a I would say it's a certain hardcore that's interested in it because you can't. Again, it's like expanding your your time. Uh, something I I, I I spend maybe a lot of time watching it, like ice hockey and, and and rugby, you know. But I'm not that interested in just normal football or other American football. But there's people who play who actually play foot, American football. Like not there's a town up the road from where I live, not near my town. But there's an American football league there, or not a league, but a team. It's got a stadium, like a wee stadium and all. You know what I mean? Hmm. Okay. So they buy. They've obviously bought all the the you know the armor and everything. The armor, armor. And the, like all the rest of it. Yeah. So that's expensive. I mean, if you're thinking about you're buying all that all that armor, you know that might be two hundred two hundred pound or something. Yeah. So they're obviously interested to do it, like, because you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't spend that money if you didn't want to do it, like. Okay. I, mean, I know that baseball, I heard, used to be popular in the UK also, but it's kind of become less popular over the years. Oh, well, you see baseball, I mean, uh, I think, well, they called it rounders here. Rounders. Well, I think, I think baseball is derived from rounders is what I've heard. Yeah, well, like, rounders, like, rounders is, is very popular. I mean, it's, it's not very commercialized, obviously. It's not commercialized at all. But it's hmm. it, it's very popular. I mean, it's incredibly popular. Everyone plays rounders, but it's just not come. There's no you know, there's no teams or anything. It's just the way it is, you know. So it's like trying to market frisbee. Yeah, yeah. It's that's it. Like everyone plays it, but it's not. You know, there's no baseball uh, teams or anything. You know, not here. Well, that I'm aware of anyway. Certainly, maybe. In, I could think in England there would be. There would be probably baseball team. I'm sure you get you find out anything in England. Well, you know, the Irish had a big presence in early baseball. Like if you look at the uh if you look at nineteenth century major league baseball, like the best majority of people had Irish names, it seems. Yeah, like, well so, Mac and Mac and stuff like that. Well my yeah. question is how the heck did Overard, uh, Ryan, names like that. What do you yeah. think? How did baseball catch on in Japan of all places? Yeah, I I think I heard that there was some there are some people who went overseas and taught them stuff. So. And it's just book. I guess so, yeah. I, I forget what the story was. I think I read a little bit about that. Like John McGraw might have had something to do with that. He yeah. Was like a, he was a great baseball manager for anybody who doesn't know. Mm -hmm. Although, interestingly enough, I did recently read an article about how even in the 60s, there were a lot of uh, J Japan, Japanese baseball wasn't as developed. So there was a. There's a ball player from an American ball player named Daryl Spencer who died recently, and I was reading an article about him. And in an interview he had given during his life, he said that uh, he had actually gone to Japan back in the '60s after his major league career ended to continue playing. And he was talking about how how primitive a lot of their strategy was, a lot of their technique was, and he taught them a lot of stuff to help them get better at baseball. So even in the '60s, they still hadn't quite. Uh, developed it the way it was in America. Yeah. You know, they had professional leagues and everything. Well, the Japanese like the Chinese. They find something they like and they stick to it like glue. Yeah. I mean, for God's sake, there are still people in Japan who think uh, the philosophy of the samurai is valid in their developed economy. Like, the five <laughs> rings is still really popular. That's like their... Uh, that's their how to win friends and influence people. What What is their... The Five Rings, like what is all that exactly? Uh, it's a book by Musashi Miyamoto about uh, sword fighting. Oh, <laughs> yeah, sword fighting, like the philosophy and spirit behind it. I mean, we I'm not going to knock it. It's, it seems to work for a lot of them. So, uh, what do I know? I remember listening to an episode of uh, The Fatherland where they uh, they were talking about some weeb guy who actually carries a samurai sword with him, and he oh. actually got to do it on the subway with somebody. <laughs> It was like from oh. 2012, this story, but it was something they all had read about and remembered. Oh, I know the video you're talking about. The guy was in a trench coat and he had a fedora on, and he saw someone getting. Yeah, and then he pulls out a samurai sword. It's like, for this one moment, I have dragged this thing around. Finally. <laughs> that was a catch you off guard. Some guy pulls out a sword. Yeah, well, yeah, what do you do at that point? You just like 
I'm done. I'm, you win. I, here, take my wallet. I'm getting off the next stop. You win. I do. I want none of this. How do you respond to that? It is pretty awesome, even though the guy was seemed kind of like an autiste. Yeah, exactly. Well, we appreciate our uh, our autistes here on the All Right. We give them oh, shows yeah. and let them say ridiculous things and set it to Vivaldi. <laughs> you have to keep her lit, like. What? You have to keep them lit, don't you? You have to keep them lit. Keep, keep them the lit. fires. The fires lit. Man, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm like, what the hell is this guy talking about? <laughs> and I'm like, like he's on fire. Yeah, no man, you have to keep the home fires burning. Like you know, see, see, see if one of them fa- fucking lights goes out, man. It's no good. Remember Chateau T three? He's talking about going to a club, and this girl's interested in him, and he's like, "But it's time for me to leave. I have to go home." <laughs> <laughs> that was a funny one. Yeah. Are they still submit taking submissions for Chateau Artiste? Because I know that Sven said something on Twitter about that a while back. He's like, "Give me, pay me in Chateau Artiste submissions or something." Oh, uh, jeez. I- it would be great if we can bring that one back. The problem is, is that we, I don't know where they find these guys who are so unselfconscious but so autistic that they just they say these things. I think some of them are jokes, though. Like I know that uh, I heard Artiste Prime is actually a troll, but okay. he's, just, he's just doing it as a joke. Yeah, a lot of the ones, uh, a lot of the ones they read. That's just uh, one of our trolls, Meow Blitz. He's just reading stuff he finds online, which is kind of unfortunate. But oh, right. <laughs> yeah, wait, he's just like, "Wow, this is really awful. This is going on the show." Wait, wait, Meow Blitz does them? No, no, he's done like one or two of them. Oh, okay, I know Meow Blitz is he's kind of a behind the scenes guy, but yeah, but he's, he's a Rex Meow Show. That'd be a good idea, you know, for. For like these radio shows in, in Northern Ireland, there's like a radio show that's called the uh, um, BBC Radio Ulster, and I was thinking like you could just do that, sort of ring up and get a load of like your you know Bank of England uh, statistics and whatever, and get loads of uh, garbage off it, you know, some uh, feminist blog or something, and just ring up and just garble on about that crap for about half an hour, you know, ruin the show. <laughs> <laughs> and just set it to yeah. all these autumn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Kevin, that's that's weird. hanging up on him is hate speech. We can't do that. Damn it. <laughs> and I just say, you know, try and tie it in with Adolf Hitler and all and say it was like some, just try and put a link in with Hitler somewhere, you know, just to make it wamp, wamp it out. Like, make, you know, so that they're, they're thinking, what the hell is this, you know? And then there's all these Bank of England, George, you know, that George Carney or whatever. Mm hmm. All your man Carney and all, and then try and link him in with Hitler. Just say like Hitler <laughs> said that there was, you know, certain amount of money was going into this, and certain amount of money was going into that. And then there's like this feminist stuff and all. Just start doing that. that but that's what they're doing to us. Do you know what I mean? They're they're ringing in the our shows and and talking this old garbage, you know. And then so why don't we start just doing that the same thing to them? Well, the problem is, is that they have phone screeners, and phone screeners are really good at their job. Like they can, good phone screeners can tell. All right, this guy's going to be a problem. We're just not going to call him back and get him on the line. Yeah. Also, they're they're on a delay, like a seven second delay. So if you start going off and you say like, "Well, I really think that uh, Hitler did nothing wrong," they'll cut that off before it even gets to the air. Yeah, I uh, I well that's that's fine, but there's ways on that. I mean, what would you say? I mean, the right stuff guy. What would you say is the way around that? You know. Uh, there for a well-produced radio show, there really isn't. Uh, typically, what you do is you troll the you troll the uh, comment section until they shut it down, and then they start losing traffic. Interesting. Uh, yeah, no, 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 but the the thing like what it, what it is, we've got this thing. It's like an anti-white. It's called the Nolan Show, like BBC Radio. It's BBC. There's the what like show? A, the Nolan Show, you call it, and this Nolan. Either Nolan show you could probably Google it like, but the guy's like a full on anti white like, you know, and he's he just hates he hates white people, he hates working class people and he hates Protestant people and he hates just free speech and it's just a, a nightmare of the guy. But uh as you say, like I said, it's, it's just one of them, man, the guy's just mad. But yeah, I'd protect potentially 
you know, he'd be a good guy to ring up and start talking about all this stuff about feminism and Bank of England, mark that George Carney or whatever, and start talking about this this feminist stuff or whatever, and just rat. You could just ring him up and say like, oh, well, what about George Carney? Night like, two thousand and ten, man said that there was no problem with emigration, but then the feminism, the, the impact on women and. You know the impact on on, on the working class woman, the, the black working class black woman, you know, or something. Yeah, you're right. Just starts going like that, man. You're but you're buying into the premise that these people are willing to engage. Well, you're buying into the premise that these people think these things are good ideas. They don't. They don't care. It's just a way to signal, and it's just a way to make them feel good. That's I all would, it is. I think if you caught him on the radio, if you got caught caught your man, your come your man known on the radio, and said, in two thousand and ten. The, you know, at Mark Carney, whatever you call him, and EU says that 10% of black women, this is all just theoretical, 10% of black women are being, being turned down for jobs, you know, something like that. You could find stuff like that, and then you could ring them up, and you wouldn't even really even be trolling. You maybe even be telling, maybe not the truth, but what the Bank of England says, or the European, you know, whatever, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You'd be maybe talking really, you know, because they, they're not true, whatever, but. And then and that's that's one way to troll, but it's one of those things you troll them based on emotion. You hit them rhetorically. You hit them in their feels, and you just say you're an anti-white piece of crap. That's all you are. You you hate white people. That's it. Your entire thing, or you're just this is just virtue signaling. Everything you you don't care about this stuff. You're just virtue signaling. Like for instance, uh, when President Trump back when he was running, he insulted uh, John McCain, and no one reported on the fact that. John McCain was giving Trump a rash of shit, and he was just bantering back. He gives as good as he gets. No one reports on that. But um, is McCain was it McCain that your man that has the oven chips and all that? Uh, no, he ran for president. Uh, he got captured by the Vietnamese during the Vietnam War. Evidently, he, he, uh, he, oh here, 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 he was a, your man that uh, had that radio where he said that he'd committed a crime against the Vietnamese Republic of China or something. I, honestly, I have no idea. Um, I, I he don't recall. He's a total something? mediocrity who basically got into. He got kept in the military because of his father being a military man, and he crashed like three or four planes or something like that. Just yeah, he got captured by the Vietnamese. He sang like a bird. He made a uh, propaganda video, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. But yeah. um, was it like got here? You know, here, GI, GI, Joe, here, GI. What are you doing? Have you heard that one? Have you heard that? Like what was it called, Mary Man Choi Mary or something? So what was the name of the woman? Remember she used to record, and then you you know they would play back. There was all these speakers all over the, the Vietnam or whatever. It would play back at. I think you're thinking uh, of Tokyo like, Rose. Yeah, I was is this say, it, man? Is this it? I know Tokyo Rose is an American a woman of Japanese ancestry who typhoid, is, typhoid Mary. He's also. Oh, uh, and it was <laughs> hey GI, hey GI, you your your government has abandoned you. There's no hope, you know. We have won the war. Well, yeah, that's the one what Tokyo Rose did. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say the thing of war Tokyo too. Rose or uh, Jane Fonda. Oh, why <laughs> Jane Fonda? Like it was a traitor. <laughs> the traitor one too. Uh, with the Viet Cong. Yep. I said hi. But so anyway. Back to my point, uh, there were liberals after Trump gave uh, John McCain the banter, like, oh, this is so awful, how could he do this to an American hero? And the way to get them on this is just say, you you don't care about John McCain. You don't care. You're virtue signaling. This is this is crap. Didn't Ghoul tell a story about that on The Daily Show where he was got into it on Facebook with some guy saying just that? Exactly, yeah, and he's like, oh, well, you don't care. <laughs> I was yeah. laughing out loud at that story. Yeah. <laughs> and he gets a wall text, he's like, oh, you still don't care. You, you, just, you don't care. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You, and you he said care. he was just doing it all lowercase letters and stuff. Too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just trolling the crap out of him. But that's that's where you got to hit these people. That's that's it. You hit them in the feels. It's like you don't care. You're virtue signaling. You're just doing this so you look good. Yeah. And these people are narcissists, so that will send them to the freaking moon. Yep. Same thing with uh, climate uh, change. All these people want to signal about how oh, I care so much about climate change. It's like no, you don't. It's it's not going to affect your daily life. You just want to be. Yeah. Signal. <laughs> you, well, you I, I remember tell me more about climate change. What's that? I you remember. drive an SUV. I remember tell me you. more about how much you care about climate change. Yeah, that's how I was thinking about the UKIP and all. You know, uh, I remember years ago, uh, 
you know, sending this email to Lord Moncton, and he at the time he was releasing these videos, and at the time he was sort of conflicting the climate change. Well, what he would call climate change Nazis. I think that was. I think he might have coined that term, climate change Nazis. And uh, I sent an email to him. It was a sort of a wandering email, but he replied. He's very. He's a very nice man, uh, Lord Moncton. You know, um, very patient man. You know, mm -hmm. but. But he, I mean, and he spent so much time, that guy, and that guy's a millionaire, you know, he, well, he has a castle, you know, and he's got money, and he, but he still spends time trying to stop all this nonsense, you know, whereas a guy could sit back, like the likes of your Lord Moncton there, he could sit back and go, you know, screw you. Why should I spend my time worrying about you when you're going to be the victim of this kind of thing? And a lot of these UKIP people, to be honest with you, they could just go screw you. But they're so patriotic, God bless them, that they, you know, they, they spend their time, you know, helping us out, you know. So yeah. it's, just, it's very admirable, you know. Isn't it a sad That's state of affairs that actually giving a shit about people is enough to get people to care about you? Like, we live in such an alienated and deracinated and atomized society where someone who actually says, I give a crap about you and your welfare does it for people well i mean yeah. and something i would i would i wouldn't again i i wouldn't get too excited about it i mean race is is one thing it's, it's fine but i wouldn't get too over excited about it because there'll be people there's people you know who like for example i mean the way i see it is the, the european union and stuff you've got these corrupt people doing they're bringing these people from but what you don't want to do is start uh, devaluing people like for example black people or whatever like yes there, there's a there's a there's race realism but then there's there's respect and there's decency you know and you don't want to let go of that respect and decency or even just even realistic ideas about people's abilities or anything you don't want to start re you know releasing you know so, you know do you understand what i'm saying and that's that's fine you know i do but, but you, know, you have to pick and choose you your battles like for instance you wouldn't say we respect the decency of all human people and that kind of thing when you've got a group of black uh thugs who kidnap a retarded or a disabled what i don't think it was retarded a mentally challenged white guy and force yeah. him to drink out no, of no, the toilet. no no you don't, no you you're right you're right for that <laughs> you're right man you know but at the same time you don't you don't, uh, you know, I, it's just something that worries me a wee bit, man. It's just, it's, a, it's this idea that, again, this race realism stuff is, you could end up having like a, a, you know, screwing yourself up by, you know, making people think that you're like unrealistic about people's abilities. For example, abilities to work and stuff, you know, all this other stuff. I mean, there's a lot of stuff, there's a lot of problems, you know, comes along with this race realism and all the rest of it, you know. But that that's a that's a conversation for another day, like you know. Sort of, like, well, I mean, you, if it's okay to be realistic, if you, I mean, if you're gonna talk to somebody who's actually willing to debate or who's actually willing to listen to different ideas, you can you can make perfectly rational arguments for your position about why some things are just not good ideas and why like diversity doesn't work. I mean, there's you can make plenty of level-headed arguments if you're talking to a reasonable person, but if some some most people are really, I don't think, are reasonable, generally no, speaking. So. The, the overarching problem is that we're, we're dealing with, like, a corrupt global society, you know, global, globalist corrupt banking cartel, like, you know, so uh, all that goes out the window, like, once that's kind of, you know, which is a shame, but it's just the way it is. It's unfortunate it seems to be just the way it is, like, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know. Well, sure. It'd be nice I mean, if it, it, it was nineteen, you know, nice if it was 19, 1995, you know what I mean, and all of a sudden happened, but it has happened, you know, that's what it is. I guess. You guys want to wrap up soon or anything, or do you guys want to keep going? I mean, we've been going for about three hours. Is there, I mean, no, we could, that's fine. That's I fine. Mean, we can continue talking offline if you want. Just, uh, I think that I don't want to drag the uh, live portion. I out drag it out. Like, no, yeah, it no. seems, well, it seems like we're we're losing a little bit of energy, so I think uh, it yeah. might be a good time to end it. Alexander okay. stopped us like with his, his mod, his mod uh, stuff. Like, what are you saying? We lost all the brain power in the podcast. <laughs> I was just saying, Alexander, he was very, he was very high energy, wasn't he? Like, you know, he was he was throwing out all all kinds of heavy stuff, like you know. Yeah. 
and not 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 i mean he's okay he's a very knowledgeable guy and got you know i'm not slabbering at him you know i'm just saying like he was like you say he sapped us you know he took away uh you know he's he's took he's took energy off us like you know he's probably taking <laughs> oh, yeah. that to class with him the more like you know that energy like you know batteries yeah he well yeah him. i think a lot of the uh energy of the uh hangout depends on who's participating and what kind of people they are so i mean good to have the right balance of personalities and stuff like that yeah absolutely also we've been going for three hours i don't think it's i don't think it's necessarily beyond the pale that we're all a little drained yeah yeah all I mean, right I, guys well th thanks very I much it's great to be on my face anyway i really enjoyed it and all like you know hey real quick what's your avatar northern irish it's a red hand. It's a it's a red hand of Ulster with a fascist bundle of rods, like. Oh, okay. So it's like a the yeah. red hand of Ulster. Do you understand the story behind that? Uh, I don't really know much about Ulster. I'll go very quickly. It's just that it, there was a guy, like a chief, sailing for over from Scotland, and whenever uh, you know whoever could get touch the land first would claim the land, you know. So this guy O'Neill cut his hand off and threw, you know, threw it onto the beach, you know, to get there quick, you know, first. That's where the red hand of Ulster comes from. <laughs> so he, that's why it's a hand. It literally was he, he threw his hand, he cut his own hand off and threw it just to beat your man. I guess he was, was left handed. Yeah. And then they're just a bundle of rods, just a you know, working class solidarity, like, you know. Yeah. Cool. Hey, looks like Mark Citadel just posted in the text chat. I don't know if that's the real Mark Citadel or not, though. <laughs> <laughs> One hopes. I think he had to go, but I mean. Yeah, that was really interesting getting to talk to him. I've actually been a fan of his for a while. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, both William and he were on the first Christian Hangout, so they've got a long history. Interesting. Yeah, I'll definitely check that out now. Yeah. You want to go way back to a year ago when we were just getting started and I, I had no idea how to host these things and I was comparing myself to Chris Farley on the Chris Farley show. <laughs> yeah, it's a little <laughs> bit of a high water mark. Stupid! <laughs> oh, it's, it's interesting, you know, you, you're you doing a good job, man. You know, you're doing a good job, Ian. Like, you know, cause it oh, is interesting. God. And like you say, you're never bored. You're never bored with it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for lending us your podcast because that's effectively what happened. We just showed up, said "Allahu Akbar." We're crashing this plane with no survivors. <laughs> no, that's cool. That's what these are really meant to be. It's not really like I don't really think of this as like my thing per se. I'm just like the host just, and giving people a forum to talk about stuff. So I, I feel like the guests are the real stars. Yeah. Well, we'll 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 take a wee minute and thank Jesus for you know. For looking after us here, you know, as well, because, you know, yeah, you know, without Jesus, man, you know, there's nothing, there's no hope, like, you know. Yeah, definitely. All right, well, uh, guess I'll just wrap up. I mean, if you guys want to stay and talk afterwards, we can do that. If you just want to have, like, a low-pressure conversation where we know people aren't listening in, but but uh, we can do that after we get up there. But uh, let's just do a little wrap-up here. So let's see. Thanks for... Everybody who came, thanks to Miles and Poland. Thanks to Mark Citadel. Thanks to Alexander. Thanks to Northern Irish All-Star. Thanks to Sam Heidelberg, who I guess we lost early on. I don't know if he... I thought he was going to switch to a different device, but he didn't come back, so I don't know if maybe he just wasn't feeling it or what. But thanks for coming, Sam. And thanks to William Scott. Uh, and thanks to all our listeners out there, all 12 of you still out there. Um, have a good night, everybody. 